Pierce Arid. Uh, welcome, good morning. It's a pleasure to have you here in Chicago. Let me briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Christoph Kohl. I'm uh, one of the Austrian Broadcasting Corporation's correspondents based in Washington, D.C. And today here, I'm, I'm looking forward to interesting discussions. Um, yeah, uh, it's my first ARID, so I'm, it's an honor to be here. I have the feeling that everybody in this room is smarter than I am, but I'm uh, looking forward to like learning from you and yeah. Let's start uh, with the housekeeping rules, just so we know how, how the day will work. Uh, first, uh, COVID, we are following the Chicago Department of Health COVID guidelines. According to their risk assessment, uh, masks are recommended but not mandatory, so do as you like, whatever makes you feel comfortable. Uh, Wi-Fi, always a, an important question. You have it here, Wi-Fi is convene and stay connected is the password. If you uh, scan the QR code on your badges, you can find uh, bios of today's speakers and also all the information, how to get to tonight's uh, reception, uh, how to find the food and uh, when the shuttle buses operate. Uh, if you need to take a phone call, please do so outside. There are phone booths. Otherwise, in here, please uh, keep your phones on mute. Um, next, coffee and snacks. You've seen where it is outside in the hallway. There are a couple of like snacks and coffee. So whenever you feel hungry or need a drink, uh, just go outside and find it there. Also, welcome to everybody who's joining us uh, via live stream. Uh, we are glad to have you here. Uh, so a big hello to everybody in the world who's watching us. And of course, welcome also to everybody who's here. Um, the event will be uh, recorded. So if you want to go back and look at it again. I definitely watched last year's ARIT to know what to expect. You can do so on the ARIT website. Now let's get started and see what uh, today is all about. Uh, let me thank all the organizers, funding entities, and partners. First, we want to thank the Office of Science and Technology Austria, Oster, who, of course, organized the event, and also the Federal Ministry of Education, Science, and Research, uh, there are many from the ministry who are here today, and also the Federal Ministry of European and International Affairs, and of course the Austrian Council for Research and Technology Development, who are funding and uh, supporting today's event. We also want to thank our partner organization, the Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation, for their contribution and help with organizing this event, making it all possible. What's Today's uh, focus, uh, strengthening trust and science in democracy, I think something that all of us here in the room can relate to and maybe also struggled with in the last couple of years, especially since COVID, be it scientists, be it politicians, or be it uh, us journalists, I think we all had our fair share of uh, distrust. And um, so it's interesting, how do we get those people who maybe now pay more attention to alternative facts than to actual facts. So that's today's uh, topic. The COVID-19 pandemic, of course, made clear the role of science and uh, in creating informed policies and also to serve the interest of uh, public health. How can we reach out to communities? How can we speak to them? How can we get them to uh, engage with us and listen to what scientists say and get to trust science and research? That's uh, a very important issue of the last couple of years and certainly of the years uh, coming ahead because I don't think then that things are going to get any easier. Um, I'm very much looking forward to uh, what solutions uh, some of you came up with all of that, how we can communicate, what needs to be done, how outreach needs to uh, work. So we're going to hear from leading experts who will share their perspective and on how to bridge these gaps and uh, communicate to how to communicate better. That's uh, today's focus of ARET. First, uh, we will hear from various speakers who will give like background on today's topics and share their perspectives. And we will also hear from Austrian stakeholders about uh, how their organizations help advance research and uh, perspectives. We will also hear um, from experts who will share their knowledge and uh, exchange and innovation, how that can be used to 
address those global challenges because, of course, we, we, we are struggling with those issues here in the United States, but of course also back home in Austria and basically all over the planet. It's really a global issue that we are, that we are struggling with. Um, during lunch, uh, we will stream here on the screens uh, pitches of uh, collaboration partners, and we will showcase the top 10 posters of this year's ARID poster session, so very much looking forward to their pitches and what they have to say. And then in the afternoon, we'll hear some uh, lessons about effective science communication and to learn how we can better get out our messages and how to get them, get them across. But now that's enough, enough from my side. Uh, let's start with the first short speech. Let me introduce to you today's host. Uh, most of you have met him in the last couple of days and weeks, or maybe just now at breakfast. Uh, like for me, it's also his first ERIT, and we're very glad to have him. Uh, Dr. Johannes Eigner, he is the director of OSTA. Um, he joined in October 2021. Um, because last year we said goodbye to Simone Pötcher, who a lot of you, I'm sure, know very well. Um, Dr. Eigner is a trained uh, doctor of law, but also of medicine. So, but instead of going and doing, I don't know, specializing in like malpractice law or so, he, he went ahead and uh, also worked as a spokesperson for the Federal Ministry for European and International Affairs. Johannes, the stage is all yours. Thanks, Christoph, for your kind introduction. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to have you on board at this year's conference. I think all of you in the room know Christoph as a competent and professional Austrian OIF correspondent uh, who brings the latest news about Northern America into Austrian households. So you are a household name in Austria. So all the more, is it, it is an honor and pleasure for us to have you on board. I'm here today with a sense of curiosity. After arriving in the US last October, it's my first personal encounter with the Austrian research and innovation talk, ARIT. And it's now time to reap the rewards of a half a year endeavor to prepare this conference. As the saying goes, the Weg is the Ziel, the journey is the goal. In the course of this half year of preparation uh, of ARIT together with my marvelous team at the Austrian Embassy in Washington, I had the pleasure to discover the variety of Austrian scientific diaspora in North America. I had the pleasure to learn so much about the different activities Austrian scientists are involved in. And I had the pleasure to forge friendships with many bright fellow Austrians I didn't know before. So the preparation for ARIT itself was a fulfilling and enlightening journey. And now I am looking forward to interesting discussions. I'm looking forward to getting my horizon widened in listening to you. And first and foremost, I'm looking forward to getting to know you. And I think it's now time to hand over to our guest of honor. Arit is graced with the presence of a numerous and high-ranking delegation that has made their way from Austria to Chicago. And it gives me special pride that this delegation is headed by the highest Austrian political representative in the field of research and innovation. So please welcome with me the Austrian Federal Minister for Education, Science and Research, Martin Polaschek. Uh, Mr. Minister, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear participants uh, here in the room and via live stream. Uh, and schönen guten Morgen. 
let me start with saying thank you uh, also to you, Dr. Eigner, and, uh, and the whole team for organizing uh, this wonderful event. It's really an honor for me as Austrian Federal Minister for Science, Education, and Research uh, to be here and to welcome you at this year's ARIT. I'm really delighted to be here with you today. It's, it's also my first time uh, being a guest at ARIT, and it's also uh, my first visit here to Chicago, and I'm really looking forward to exploring this uh, wonderful town, and I already had yesterday the opportunity to have a little small look uh, here at the university, and I'm sure there will be uh, opportunities in the next days to talk to you and to learn more about uh, the places you, you are working and you are studying here in the United States or in Canada. Um, it's great for me to see that so many uh, have made it possible to come here uh, in person uh, today. Uh, so it makes this event even more um, enjoyable. I was a rector when I had to close a university about two and a half years ago, and, and in this, in this uh, month it's, there were so many conferences via, uh, via the Internet, and it's so very important, especially for researchers, to meet each other, because we know that research is not only sitting and reading or working in a laboratory, it also is so much about talking with each other, learning from each other, and this works much better if we see and feel each other uh, closer. So this is a very good opportunity in the next days uh, to, to work together on, on new, on new uh, projects and to learn from each other, especially experiences you had during COVID, but much more what you are planning in the next months and years and what your ways will, will lead you in, in your specific areas. Um, in Austria, we just have started another school year facing many of the same challenges we had in the last years uh, regarding both the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. Uh, at the moment, there is a growing feeling in Austria that we are living at a turning point in time. The last crisis and disruptions like the financial crisis, the digital revolution, COVID, climate change, and now the war in Ukraine have brought about major changes that will significantly affect our societies. And however, they also have a profound impact on research and, innova research and innovation itself, and I want to address some of the issues now. Some countries and regions still uh, see travel restrictions due to COVID. Uh, some recommend wearing masks. In some countries, it is obliged. In some countries, they say wearing a mask is not healthy. Uh, so the situation is quite different in, in different countries. But uh, at a whole, the situation is improving um, and allowing for much more needed personal exchanges, as I mentioned already. Um, especially among researchers that were hindered uh, for more than two years now. Um, security issues and, and risk of foreign interference, for example, the collaboration uh, with China have become a significant issue, uh, while Russia's war of aggression in Ukraine confronts also all of us uh, with new challenges. At the same time, let us not forget that there remain uh, important global challenges that we must not lose track and need to face. Reaching the UN Sustainable Development Goals, curbing excess climate change, and fighting poverty and hunger and some of the crit are some of the critical issues that we have to tackle globally. Uh, I'm, I know progress will be difficult uh, to achieve and will necessitate far-reaching measures. But for this uh, success, it is important to strengthen trust in science and in research. As stated before, uh, Russia's unjustified aggression against the Ukraine confronts us with complex and demanding challenges. However, one thing is clear. Only together can we stand firm. Uh, therefore, we have put in place several support mechanisms for the people of Ukraine on the European level and on national levels. Let me just name a few. We waived uh, tuition fees for all Ukrainian students at public universities and the teacher training colleges in the summer term 2022 and now in the fall term. With dedicated scholarships, we support Ukrainian students, scientists and researchers who continue their education or work in Austria 
and we have awarded more than 300 scholarships so far. And furthermore, higher education and research institutions, as well as funding agencies, have taken numerous measures, and we are grateful for their engagement and readiness to help. Within the international cooperation setting, the EU member states and the European Commission are jointly placing greater emphasis on strategic autonomy and value-based international cooperation in science and research among like-minded partners. And particularly in science, research and innovation, as you all know, working together across borders is essential. Only together we can reach and exceed common goals. With the EU research program Horizon Europe, we have one important tool at our disposal to foster research and innovation. In cooperation with the United States and Canada, Austria builds on a wide range of cooperation activities, programs and networks, including the Marshall Plan, celebrating its 75th anniversary in Austria this year, over 70 years of Fulbright Austria, as well as Austrian centers at universities worldwide, including several in North America. And we are also very proud of the Askina Network, which connects Austrian researchers, scientists, and innovators in North America and is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. Our successful cooperation includes the yearly Askina Awards to honor the outstanding work and publications of young Austrian scientists here in North America. And allow me to congratulate especially this year's Askina awardees, again, who I already had the pleasure to meet when I awarded their prizes to them in Vienna this June. And I'm glad that you are here with us today to present your work uh, later in the afternoon. But let me also highlight uh, new elements in our transatlantic cooperation. A memorandum of understanding was signed in April concerning cooperation in, advantings, in, advan <coughs> sorry, in advancing apprenticeships between the United States and Austria to address the shortage of skilled labor. In addition, a study of academic mobility as well as scientific co-publications between North America and Austria compiled with the help of many of you here today, has been finalized and made available to all of you on the ARID website. We also plan, based on the best practices from Askina, to support networking uh, of Austrian researchers globally. We believe that Austrian researchers in the United States, in Canada, will benefit also from those new measures, such as an online platform for networking and information on funding opportunities, as well as the support of networking meetings to bring Austrian researchers in their countries closer together. But let me come back uh, to the topic of this year's ARID, strengthening trust in science and democracy a topic which is very close uh, to my heart as professor, former rector, and now as minister. Especially in the wake of the pandemic and the threats of climate change, we have seen that those crises are a double-edged sword for science and research, not only in Austria, but also here, of course, in the United States and all around the globe. On the one hand, scientists and researchers are in high demand to deliver fast results and provide evidence for critical policy decisions and have become <clears throat> indispensable in explaining and communicating the current knowledge available. On the other hand, we see a worrying rise in skepticism towards science and research as well as towards democracy in general, which creates a wide range of problems for and in our societies. In our ministry, being responsible for education, science, and research, we have the opportunity to put measures in place spanning from the kindergartens to adult and higher education and research. In order to strengthen trust in science and research, we need to foster understanding for scientific processes across all ages and actively engage the public in science and research science and research endeavors. We already have a number uh, of measures and activities put in place in my ministry. So let me name just a few concrete examples. 
Many of you know, with Sparkling Science 2.0, we support projects bringing together scientists in school classes, but also citizen scientists to work on concrete research questions. And the topics span from multilingualism and inclusion to energy efficiency and biodiversity. Since 2004, we have supported children's and youth universities, Kinder- und Jugenduniversitäten. Inclusion is an important pillar of the program, reaching out to children and young people from educationally disadvantaged backgrounds, with migration backgrounds, with disabilities, and or from peripheral regions. And in addition, our universities, agencies, and research organizations are very active in engaging the public in science and research. For instance, the ERD hosts Erinnern.at for all matters regarding Holocaust education. The FWF doubled the budget for its science communication program and hosts the science talk format and pools. And the Austrian Academy of Sciences is currently running an essay competition for ideas to increase public trust in science. However, uh, skepticism towards science is still particularly high in Austria. Therefore, we need to have a closer look into the causes for this skepticism to develop additional initiatives as necessary. A recently commissioned study will therefore look into the historic, socio-economic, systemic and structural dimension of this skepticism. In the end, the public has to be able to trust well-grounded science. Hence, we need a joint approach that takes a long-term view in order to strengthen trust in science and democratic values. Networking is an important first step, and we will host the first Trust in Science and Democracy networking conference in Vienna next week. For Austria, as a location for science and research, we have to be aware of the challenges ahead but also see and embrace the opportunities arising from the strength and excellence of our researchers and innovators in many of those pressing fields. To take full advantage of those opportunities, we are continuously working on providing the best conditions possible for top researchers and talent as well as cooperation partners in academia and business around the world. In cooperation with our partner ministries and agencies, we are providing funding opportunities for basic research and applied research alike. While we need fast responses to emerging issues and those that we know well of, we also need the long-term perspective and curiosity of basic research to go beyond and be prepared for challenges that we are not aware of yet. So this year is an important year for Austrian research, technology, and innovation concerning the new uh, strategy. And we will be adopting the second research, technology, and innovation pact for the years of 2024 to 2026. This also includes future funding. And this time, we not only have to discuss a further part uh, of growth for research and development, but we need to help our higher education and research institutions as well as funding agencies in dealing with the high inflation felt by all members of the scientific community. Science and research are central to our governance program. We need an excellent science, research, and innovation base for our societies to prosper and become more resilient in facing the challenges ahead. In Austria, we are in a good way to delivering all the necessary instruments for that. And my sincere gratitude goes to all scientists and researchers for their never-ending efforts and their dedication, while quite often facing critique in the wake of science skepticism. So I very much look forward to our exchanges and discussions today, and thank you for your interest. Danke für Ihr Kommen, für Ihr Interesse, Ich freue mich auf einen spannenden Tag gemeinsam mit Ihnen.
Thank you very much, Minister Polashek. I just realized you and I have something in common today. We are both speaking in front of our predecessors. Uh, <laughs> So also a warm welcome to Hannelore Veit and former Minister Fassmann. I think it's a sign of quality for this event because people keep coming back. So welcome to everybody who is here again. <laughs> Speaking of coming back, uh, the next uh, speaker doesn't really need an introduction because uh, you know her very well. Barbara Weitgruber, she was a founding staff member and then director of the Office of for international relations and a lecturer at the Karl Franzens University. And uh, most importantly, she helps uh, to shape the programs of the Austrian Marshall Plan and the Fulbright Austria program. Uh, very important, I guess, uh, for a lot of you here. So without further ado, Baba, the stage is yours. Dear Minister, dear participants, um, it's a pleasure for me to be here, um, especially because in this windy city, many, many years ago, actually 35 years ago, um, I was a Fulbright um, student, uh, got a master's degree from the University of Illinois in Chicago, worked as a teaching assistant, and actually during that time I was hired by the University of Graz. So of course it's, it's nice, um, and actually the minister at that time was already working there as well, so we have known each other for a long time. Um, but today I have the pleasure to give you a short glimpse into the developments in research, technology and innovation, both at the national level and at the level of the European Union. As the Minister mentioned, uh, we try to provide the best framework for researchers in Austria, and with a research intensity of 3.2%, Austria ranks third after Sweden and Belgium within the European Union. Within 10 years, actually, we managed to increase the number of RTI personnel by almost 50%. Of course, if there is money, there will also be more staff. Within the OECD, Austria is placed second when it comes to the proportion of STEM graduates, which is currently 31.4%. This might be surprising because everyone complains that there are not enough STEM graduates, but actually we rank second, but of course we want to be better. Within the EU Research and Innovation Program Horizon 2020, Austria held a success rate of over 17%, um, and we were placed third within the European Union. Additionally, we already have started, and it was mentioned by the Minister, into the new EU research program. Um, and Austria holds the second place in the EU when it comes to the European research grants, the most prestigious and attractive grants for basic research in the European Union, proportional to our population. Within our National Research, Technology and Innovation Strategy 2030, our focus is on excellence, on impact and on talents. We continue, and the minister mentioned it already, our growth path uh, with an overall increase of 27% for research performing organizations and funding agencies in the first three years of the pact 2021-2023. And as the minister mentioned, we are now negotiating the second pact. The first pact enabled, uh, for instance, the Austrian Science Fund, the FVF, our main funding agency for basic research to start an excellence initiative and the Vice President Ursula Jakobek will provide more information on this flagship initiative and on the FF portfolio later on. The Austrian Academy of Sciences, and it was mentioned already that our former Minister Heinz Fassmann is here, he is now the President of the Austrian Academy of Sciences and with the increased budget the Academy of Sciences will also expand the portfolio among others, into metabolic disease to be located in Graz, and research into anti-Semitism. The Institute of Science and Technology Austria, ISTA, will grow up to 100 research groups by 2036, providing attractive opportunities on the way, both for junior and senior researchers uh, globally. So maybe you yourself or colleagues will have an interest in joining ISD Austria sooner or later. The ÖAD, our agency for education and internationalization, is another key actor in implementing educational and research and innovation related policies in Austria. And you will hear from its CEO, Jakob Kalice, a little later. A milestone far beyond research and innovation is the creation of our new National Center for Climate Research 
and general public services called Geosphere Austria. It's actually a merger of our national meteorological and geophysical services jointly with the Austrian Geological Survey. Geosphere Austria will be a center of competence providing data and information and services starting on January 1st, 2023 with around 500 staff members. Helping us face climate change, extreme weather occurrences, natural disasters, and so on. The positions of both the scientific director and the financial director are currently internationally open for applications. So if you know people, please um, convey this me message. And we are, um, of course, very eager to talk to you during the break and give you more information. In the context of energy transition, and in particular the current geopolitical situation, increasing energy in independence has become vital. Our ministry therefore provides 17 million in special funding for research into green hydrogen for the Declan University of Graz and University of Leoben. This measure will also support Austria's goal of becoming climate neutral and aligns with EU activities such as the European Research Area Pilot Project on Green Hydrogen and the Pan-European Data Platform on Hydrogen Projects. As the COVID-19 pandemic has shown, clinical research with its associated societal issues plays a vital role when it comes to developing and optimizing new diagnostic and therapeutic approaches. In order to encourage and actually to achieve innovative outcomes in disease and patient-oriented clinical research and to bridge gaps in funding within Austria's non-commercial clinical research, our ministry will launch Austria's first clinical research groups program next week. The Ludwig Boltzmann Association will manage it on behalf of our ministry, starting with a budget of 24 million euro. Funding provides for the implementation of scientific high-quality clinical research projects carried out by outstanding clinical researchers internationally. Austria is in a leading position in regards to publications and patents in the field of quantum research. And we had the pleasure of visiting two national laboratories yesterday, and we're very pleased to hear that there is a strong cooperation between the US and Austria in the field of quantum. With a new program, Quantum Austria, 170 million from the EU's Next Generation Recovery Fund will be available and is managed both by the Austrian Science Fund and the Austrian Research Promotion Agency. A number of projects have already been approved, among them a large infrastructure project under the supervision of the Vienna Scientific Cluster, adding to the overall high-performance computing research infrastructure in Austria. Furthermore, we implemented an important reform regarding access to data for science. And this was a topic in, in former ARITS um, where there was a complaint that access to data is something where Austria is not strong in, to put it nicely. Um, the new Austrian Microdata Center launched on July 1st this year, operated by Statistics Austria, will now make all the difference. It closes a gap compared to the other OECD members in providing access to scientific, for the scientific community to microdata in statistical registers through combining data sets. It also opens up new opportunities for research areas such as climate change, pandemic preparedness, demographic developments, as well as on data regarding labor markets, among others. Accreditation and access is possible for organizations and researchers outside of Austria. So actually, international research, US research groups, can be accredited um, to have access to these data sets. The transfer of knowledge and technology, as well as intensive cooperation with business, is another important focus of our ministry. Our aim in the strategy of the uh, government is actually to double the number of commercially successful academic spin-offs by 2030, so quite an ambition. Spin-off fellowships support founders and entrepreneurs at higher education and research institutions at the amount of 50 million um, up to 2026. But those have to be people already working at Austrian higher education and research institutions. Let me now quickly turn to the EU level. As I mentioned, the new European research program Horizon Europe with a budget of 95.5 billion until 2027 started in 2021 with a strong, fo strong focus on mission orientation, innovation and impact. 
Five missions have meanwhile been agreed upon in the European Union. One of them is um, the adoption to climate change, including social transformation. One is focusing on cancer. One on healthy oceans, seas, and coast and inland waters. One on climate neutral smart cities. And one on soil health and food. So you see the climate related issues as well as um, health are in the focus in the European Union. Austria will, of course, actively engage itself in all the missions, and we are developing a dedicated cross-ministerial, cross-sectoral implementation strategy by the end of the year. A further objective of Horizon Europe is to strengthen international cooperation strategically, as the Minister already pointed out, value-based international cooperation. This also includes efforts to associate further countries, non-EU members, to Horizon Europe. The European Union is making progress with 16 countries already associated to the program, and formal negotiations start with Canada and New Zealand this fall. At the same time, we are working on the so-called European research area in Europe. Um, in 2021, the Council of the European Union adopted a pact for research and innovation, as the foundation of the so-called new European research area. What does this mean? Uh, the European Commission and the EU member states are jointly working, both at national levels and at EU level, to tackle some of the challenges and barriers that are still being faced in research and innovation by researchers and entrepreneurs. Um, Further improving the framework of open science is one of the goals, and it's great to see that actually the U.S. is also working towards that goal with the recently updated U.S. policy, the policy guidance to federal departments and agencies to make the results of taxpayer-supported research immediately available to the American public at no cost. So this is very similar to what we are doing in the European Union, and I think this also shows uh, this value-based international cooperation. The European Open Science Cloud, creating an open and secure virtual environment, a worldwide web of fair data and services, is another European flagship initiative where scientific data can be stored, managed, and analyzed. It aims to give the EU a global lead in research data management, also ensuring that European scientists and researchers are able to reap the full benefits of data-driven science. An agreement is also there on reforming the research assessment process, and this is very challenging, of course, and it should also be done in international cooperation. Um, the idea is um, to recognize the diverse output of researchers and not just focusing on publications. 350 organizations from 40 countries have already signaled an interest in becoming part of this coalition to implement changes. One of them is actually the Austrian Science Fund and Universities Austria, represented uh, by Johannes Fröhlich, who is chairing uh, the task force on research for Universities Austria. So if you're interested, you can talk to the two colleagues uh, during the break. Attractive research careers is, of course, another topic because creating an attractive environment for researchers um, is important to be an attractive location for research, um, and Europe wants to aim for that. Um, trust in science uh, is another key element of a European research area, and of course research infrastructure, both at EU and at national levels. There is a European roadmap, and nationally we are working on an Austrian Research Infrastructure Action Plan 2030. The plan focuses on expanding national research infrastructure, but also uh, relates to the participation in European and international large-scale research infrastructure. And we have a national database, the Austrian Research Infrastructure Database, open for collaboration, offering information to facilitate the cooperative use of research infrastructures in science, research, business, and industry. The database provides access to almost 2,200 research infrastructures from over 130 Austrian research performing institutions, including companies. And the database already had worldwide access from 160 countries. And the third most visits, uh, which I'm glad about, comes from the US. So you seem to know about it. Um, measures regarding international cooperation were already mentioned, value-based cooperation, but also um, tackling foreign interference and promoting a European science diplomacy agenda. 
Now, before coming to an end, uh, let me take the opportunity to thank everyone involved in planning and organizing this ARIT, uh, in particular the Austrian Embassy in Washington and the Office of Science and Technology, represented by Johannes Eigner, um, and your team, of course, uh, the team of our ministry. Um, a special thanks goes to the Austrian Council for Research and Technology Development, which is co-sponsoring this event, but of course to all of you, all of you, the delegation who came to uh, Chicago and all the participants, because the success is only possible through interacting and I look forward to many discussions and many personal encounters during this day and the reception tonight. Thank you. It's amazing to hear about all those programs and like funding opportunities. So thank you very much, Barbara Weidgruber, for like this overview and for your work and commitment. Seems like Barbara is a good person to find during a coffee break if you need maybe some help in finding programs or funding. Uh, speaking of programs, like I, we're moving on to the presentation of two programs. Uh, first is uh, Ursula Jakovec. She's the commercial vice president of the Austrian Science Fund. And uh, next up is then Jakob Kalicza. I hope that I pronounced it correctly. <laughs> Man Managing director of Austria's Agency for Education and Internation Internationalization. So they will give two stakeholder pitches. Ursula Jakovec, you're up first. Thank you very much that I have the possibility to speak to you today for the Austrian Science Fund. Um, thank you, and I say herzliches Grüß Gott from my, from my point of view. So I would like to uh, talk a bit of the Science Fund. Uh, what is the Austrian Science Fund? It's very important for Austria, I think, because... Um, sorry, I have a, a presentation. Is it? That's been lying there for a while. I can just... Oops. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> That's what Technic is for. I they say one minute, it should be coming up. Okay. Maybe I talk a bit about the agenda. I would like to, <laughs> to start. Uh, what is the positioning of the Science Fund? What is the fi uh, founding uh, portfolio? And what is the founding portfolio selected for you today? Because. Uh, it, it's very special to speak today uh, to you because it's the American crowd, so uh, it's a bit different to talking to Austrians. Um, well, I think it should work now. Huh? Oh, here I am. What the positioning we had. What is the FWF, or we say Austrian Science Fund, standing for? Well, the FWF understands this as an experimental or theoretical work that primarily leads to new knowledge about the fundamental of phenomena and observable facts without aiming at a specific application or implementation, but is also open to application-oriented aspects. This means also supporting for knowledge transfer and science scholar communication are integrated part of the FWF work. We also have a broadcast new, I was talking to uh, yesterday to some of you, which is called Was die Welt zusammenhält, connect, connecting the world, uh, where we, we're talking to uh, very famous persons from Austria with scientists. So if you have time, please go and listen to Ö1, Was die Welt zusammenhält. What is the FWF funding portfolio? Well, we have exploring new frontiers, we have cultivating talents, we have realizing new ideas. Funding, funding top quality research. We have products, 40% of our budget is standalone projects, which is very important for us and for you. We have international programs, we have thousand ideas programs, we have the cluster of excellence. Barbara already mentioned this. I will go into deeper after uh, introducing our program. We have the emerging fields, we have the research groups, we have special research programs, what is very important is all the start programs, the Wittgenstein Award, but what we also have is private funding, which is called from Weiss Stiftung, also Asmet Stiftung, which is a connection to the first. 
uh, we have NetDT, we have the Herzfeld funding, and we have the funding from the European um, uh, community, which is Quantum Austria. Cultivating talents we have is the human resource developments. We have the DOC funds, and we have the DOC funds Connect. Uh, the Schrödinger programs, I think a lot of you know about the Schrödinger and you, maybe you had the scholarship of Schrödinger. We have the Esprit programs and uh, Richter, which is going to cultural events and uh, the young independence researchers with a start, start, starting prices. Uh, we also have realizing new ideas with the Cliff uh, program, the Peak, the Connecting Minds, but all these you can read on our internet. Uh, and maybe we are more interested in, then please look at the internet. Uh, what is the funding portfolio for us and how much are the numbers on funding applications? Uh, I have I've done a kind of uh, how many applications do we have and we only can well, what I can say, we can fund not even a quarter, but we would have so many good applications, but due to budget, we only can afford a quarter of, uh, to fund these applications. This is also the total volume. It's, it's one billion. I have heard yesterday one billion. You had in Argon as well. Uh, but that would, that if we would fund 100%, we would have 1.2 billion a year for the total funding. I would like to uh, tell you a few of your programs, maybe for you which are interested, that's the Esprit program. Esprit early stage program, uh, which is high qualified postdocs from all disciplines from Austria and abroad. It's for maximum five years after PhD. Uh, the object is funding excellent and innovative research, retaining and attracting outstanding researchers supporting the advancement of women in research, which is very important for us, because if you think we have been founding 4,500 people last year, 47% are women, and 67% are under 36 years. The funding is the salary for the project head and uh, 15 or 25,000 euros per year. Then I would like to tell you about the SFPs, we call Special Research Programs. The target group are five to 15 international outstanding researchers make up to a special research program at an Austrian research institute, open to researchers abroad with a minimum of 25% affiliation with an Austrian research institute. The objective, uh, Objectives is to productivity interconnected research network and the long term and multiple interdisciplinary work and in complex research topics. The funding is a million per year for up to eight years. And we make a review after four years of the outcome of the SFPs. Then a very important program for us, uh, Barbara already mentioned it, it's Quantum Austria, founded uh, by the European Uni Union under the Development and the Resiliation Plan. We do this together with, with the Austrian Research Promotion Agency. Uh, the program is from 22 to 26. Uh, we have been splitting the budget into the, into the Austrian Research Promotion Agency, which is about 60%, and 40% is about the Austrian Science Fund. The target group is researchers from universities and non-universities uh, research institutions and rele relevant industrial researchers departments in field of quantum research and quantum technology. We have seen yesterday how important quantum is and I think Austria is one of the very important countries which is leading as I was working before for the Austrian uh, Academy of Scientists. There are two very important institutes which called ECOCI maybe you know them, uh, and they are really leading in quantum Austria. So, um, the next is uh, the new, which is called the excellent means Austria, no, excellent Austria, uh, are the cluster of excellence. 
uh, and the emerging fields and the Austrian chairs of excellence. We have a new program which is called Excellent Austria. We already started it a uh, half a year ago. Uh, the purpose was for measuring the class of excellence for young, talented, and to strengthen Austrian competitiveness international. Uh, we had 35 um, uh, applications. Out of the 35, we have the second stage, which we have 11 now. Uh, but they are so good, I can't, I can't tell you we would like to found 35 clusters of excellence, but it's not possible. We are very sorry for that. Um, we have 11 now for the second stage, I've already told you, and we are very uh, suspicious and, and hopefully uh, we, have the, we found out the best. It's not ours we found out, it's uh, an international committee who is uh, looking for who is the best in Austria. It's not the Austrians who look are the best in Austria. So this, the second measure we also have is emerging fields, which is new as well, uh, which opens a proposal this month and uh, will be founded also uh, next year for uh, emerging fields. And the third we have, we are still working on it, is Austrian Chairs of Excellence, and this will go on uh, in 2023. So thank you very much for listening to me, and if you have any questions with the Austrian Science Fund, please talk to me uh, afterwards. Thank you. Dear Minister, dear participants, um, it's a real pleasure to be here again at ARIT uh, this year. Uh, thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity of presenting some of the work uh, ÖAD is doing and uh, give you some insight into recent developments. Um, now I also have a presentation and I'm not quite sure how to use this. Do I have to do some? Ah, yes, Good. thank you. Um, so I'll first give you just a quick overview um, um, on what ÖAD is, is doing, what our role is, um, before I go into um, some of the recent developments uh, in the Erasmus program. So ÖAD is a government-owned uh, agency. Our yearly budget is around 90 million euros at the moment. And uh, we focus on uh, programs and activities in the field of internationalization in all different um, uh, fields or areas of education, but also science and research. And in addition, we also have a number of programs that are oriented towards the Austrian education system, so which don't have a strong international tie. Um, some of the programs and activities have been mentioned already, sparkling science um, on the one hand. Uh, Minister, you mentioned the Rinanati Holocaust education and some other um, programs that we implement for the ministry. Um, now, uh, with respect to um, interna internationalization in the academic sector, which I'm going to focus on now, we have a number of different uh, activities uh, with which we try to support um, uh, our academic institutions in Austria in their um, efforts uh, for being international and collaborating internationally. And um, so our portfolio is really um, focused on to these support issues. And uh, first and foremost, and this is the first one, uh, first point on the list here, um, is uh, mobility grants and um, uh, projects, uh, project funding, smaller projects, um, which is uh, the most, most important uh, part of our work with this respect, I would, I would think. Um, so we have about 40 million euros each year in this sector of mobility grants, um, different scholarships, including the Erasmus uh, Plus program, which is uh, the biggest uh, of the scholarship programs. Um, but we also have nationally funded programs like the uh, Ernst Mach program, um, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, the Ernst Mach program is an incoming program for uh, master students, PhDs, but also postdoc. And we are able to fund around 300 to 350 um, uh, people a year coming uh, into Austria through this grant. Um, this is excluding uh, uh, people coming from the Ukraine who also use this um, uh, scholarship. 
Um, so this is the first point, and if you're interested, have a look at our website, grants.at. Um, there we have all the different uh, schemes uh, at this website, but there are also um, information from other um, uh, uh, scholarships that, that are not ours, um, but uh, different um, institutions have fed into this database. The uh, second point, uh, we support in international university networks. Uh, we just uh, recently, or the ministry just recently established the Africa Uninet two years ago, um, which is one of the networks. We have two networks in, in, Asian, in Asia. And um, I'd say that also the, the Austrian centers, um, of which we have four in North America, is also kind of a, a network, I would say, with a very special focus on Austrian history, Austrian um, language studies. Um, third, uh, study in Austria. Um, this is our program for promoting the Austrian uh, higher education sector. Um, just to give you a, a best insight, I suppose, um, we have about 5,000 requests each year of um, people from outside Austria who are interested in studying in Austria and coming to Austria, and um, we kind of let them uh, lead them into the Austrian university system. Um, fourth point, student housing is also uh, quite a big issue um, because you can imagine um, when people come to Austria for a couple of days or a couple of weeks or months, it's uh, quite a hassle to find ac accommodation and this is why we um, in total have 3,000 beds in Austria distributed um, um, that we rent out for really a couple of days or up to 12 months. Um, and last but not least, we also give advice on questions of uh, visa and residency issues, also a big, um, big topic, and we closely collaborate here with the Foreign Ministry and the Ministry of Interior, but also the regional governments who are in, in, in charge of implementing these uh, residency issues. So let me now um, uh, um, take a short um, uh, look at the uh, possibilities of the Erasmus Plus program uh, because there are some uh, interesting developments going on. Um, now what you see on this chart here is the, the so-called international um, funding uh, window of the Erasmus Plus program in 2022. Um, you can see we've had um, a total of 330,000 euros um, that we were able to invest in, in these projects. So it's not really a, a, a lot of, of funding here, um, but it would be very much smaller if the ministry um, would not invest an additional 200,000 um, euros uh, this year and has um, invested in the last couple of years as well. So we are extremely thankful uh, for that because we can implement um, a, a number, a good number of Erasmus programs, uh, um, projects. So this year we were able to fund 12 projects um, uh, that contained mobilities um, to 18 and from 18 different universities in the U.S. Um, uh, they are on the map, so the one in uh, dark blue, the, there we have four universities, and the one in light blue, this is one university in, in, in the area. So um, if, I, if I can see this collect, uh, correctly, the Illinois um, area is, is doing quite well. Um, <laughs> and this funding opportunity is also interesting because it goes in both directions. You can fund uh, mobilities coming from the U.S., going to um, Austria, and the other way around. And um, this is not only for students, uh, bachelor, master, and PhD, but also for um, university staff. And uh, uh, we know from the last couple of years that the uh, relation is about two-thirds uh, students and one-third university staff that is making use of this um, Erasmus Plus funding. Now, as I said, this is not a lot um, of money for a, a country as big as the U.S., right? So um, what is happening, happening now um, is that there is a quite uh, interesting new funding opportunity um, via the Erasmus Plus program. This is fairly new. It was only implemented by the beginning of last year. Um, 
So um, how does this work? Um, European higher education um, uh, institutions may now use the intra-European funding partly for uh, global outgoing mobilities. So until recently, um, you could use these funds only to go to the different European uh, countries um, coming from Austria or, or other European countries. Now up to 20% may be used for going to countries outside of, the U of, of Europe. So also to the US, but to, well, most countries in the world, really. Um, in total, this adds up at this point in time, uh, time into a potential of 4.6 million euros. So this is not for the US only, but um, worldwide. And um, uh, this is quite interesting. Why? Because it's not being used at this point in time. Um, and why is it not being used? It's a new instrument, of course. We had to deal with COVID, so people rather went to locations closer to home. Um, uh, and uh, um, also uh, Erasmus Plus funding went down last year a little bit, and only this year went up again. Um, and of course, for institutions, it's also much easier to, um, to use the long existing collaborations. Now, um, is it of interest to look into this uh, for you? Yes. Why? Because uh, in the next couple of years, the Erasmus Plus funding is going to rise constantly. In fact, until 2027, we're going to see um, more or less a, a doubling of the funding for Erasmus Plus. So the potential in the next year is growing from, from 9.6 million euros to 9 million euros. And uh, what we also know is that um, Austrian universities, they will have to look into the, um, the uh, outgoing um, possibilities and regions um, to become more attractive. And of course, um, as you all know, the US is extremely attractive for uh, Austrian universities. Um, so that um, I think this will be um, a, a very good instrument for um, setting up new collaborations. Now, one more thing. This is um, an outgoing instrument only, so only from Austria to the US or North America to Canada, not the other way around, um, can be funded. This, again, is for students, uh, bachelor, master, and PhD. Um, and university staff, and it's both for um, study courses, but also for work placement. So students from Austria can also go on work placements here in the US. If you come from a company, uh, for example, this is also a possibility. Now, how does this, uh, how does this work in practice? Um, what you need is an um, agreement on, an, on the institutional level. So this is not um, taking place on the level of the research, individual researcher, but you have to have an institutional agreement first. Um, and uh, as you know, um, uh, um, interna the international offices of universities, they are dealing with these um, uh, agreements. And um, so if you maybe already have someone in mind in your, um, on the Austrian side, um, make them go to the international office and you go to the international office for setting up um, such kind of agreement. Um, ERD is going to um, uh, support this uh, process at the next NAFSA conference in, in Washington, D.C., where we have a, a special slot for um, Erasmus Plus uh, collaboration. The NAFSA is really the biggest um, education fair here in, in North America, where thousands and, and thousands of people um, are, uh, are partaking. Taking. Um, so to, uh, to sum up, I think this is an interesting new opportunity and, um, and I hope that the expert community here in the U.S. will, will um, help in, in uh, well, making use of, of this new um, opportunity, really. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to both of you for your presentations. I, I like the, the matchmaking at NAFSA. It's very much uh, dating, but make it science, like the TikTok generation would say. <laughs> Next up is our uh, keynote speech. Uh, Christina Marizzi, an award-winning scientist and educator. I've met her pretty much exactly a year ago, uh, ago uh, around the UNGA. Um, I was very fascinated by her important and very interesting work. 
Let me just present her to you a little bit. Uh, she currently serves as the Director of Com Community Science at Biobus. That's an organization that helps K-12 and college students discover, explore, and pursue science. It's a very much an outreach uh, project. She holds a PhD in genetics from the University of Vienna. And since 2015, she has directed a teaching laboratory and co-developed several signature citizen science programs around biodiversity in New York City. They have a big program also in Central Park, if I remember correctly. Um, and she's also a scientific advisor to the New York City school system. So, Christina, we're all looking forward to your speech. So thank you so much for your kind introduction. And yes, I also was allowed to actually have visual aids or slides, um, which I really appreciate. Um, I'm here, and I'm, again, super excited to speak to a room of scientists and the Austrian delegation, hopefully all supporters of science. Sometimes you know you have to ask because you never know, right? Um, but I was actually asked to set the stage for a fruitful day of discussions about, like, you know, how can we, like, you know, increase public trust in science, right? Um, I, I dare not to comment too much about democracy because it's not my personal background, but I think these two are intertwined, as you can see. Um, and I'm just going to see where I'm going to... Next one. Do I click the arrow or not? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so what I plan to talk about is um, basically I would like to talk about science engagement because sharing information, as we all saw, is not enough. We need to get people interest in science, which can also lead to science engagement, which is the best way to actually um, have people understanding and, you know, participating in the um, scientific process, then I'm going to loop into trust and transparency, which I think, like, are one of the key elements in meaningful science communication and building trust in science. And then I present one of the solutions. Um, again, this is informed from my personal work as a science communicator and outreach specialist. It is cultural responsive communication, and also I will close out for the right to science, which I usually highlight. It's not coming up a lot in everybody's work, but I usually talk about this, especially when reaching out to marginalized communities. So science is everywhere. Um, again, I'm speaking here, I'm preaching the core, as you say, right? In, it's, I think most of you really will agree it, it, it allowed huge advancements in technology and in medicine. Um, it increases our fundamental knowledge, how we see the world, how we engage with the world. It also creates new technology. Uh, it dreams up new applications. We just heard, like, you know, there's an investment in, like, you know, can we have more spin-off companies, like, you know, coming out of universities, right? Uh, and then it's also, for me, it's a pathway of shared ideas. It's not one idea that's actually, like, you know, solving the world. Collaboration is just super important. And as we are in, still in the, meeting, in the middle of an ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, I hope the WHO is going to call off the pandemic pretty soon, but again, there's still work to be done. It again shows, again, in a time of crisis, how scientists and how the world can come together to really tackle our biggest issues in the world, right? When funding is not an issue, when all the time is invested in solving, in solving one problem, you know, a lot of things actually can happen. The pandemic also has significantly altered how science is conducted. The speed of how information is shared is incredible. It's also shared like open access, online. Again, we have to speak here about the digital divide because not everybody has actually access to an internet where, you know, all information is shared, right? But if you can, you know, and if you can read, which is another thing we also have to address globally, you can actually see, like, um, what, inf what information is actually happening in the lab. And at the same time, face masks became a political issue. And that's also very interesting, like, you know, how people follow science and what is actually where do people start criticizing science, right? Very often it actually comes into government policies and applications to your personal life. So when science is everywhere and science is every, everywhere in our daily life, let's discuss how, to, how do people think, feel and, about science and um, scientists itself. And I want to start with some numbers 
I'm a scientist. Um, and there are actually many studies out there. And again, full disclosure, I'm, I'm, this is not my main speciality, right? I'm a trained geneticist, and my background is in science communication. But I just picked two, which I think, like, you know, bring up some meaningful points. Um, they, the studies that I picked today more or less tell the same story. One of them is more focused on the European level, and one of them is more focused on the United States level. And they both talk about science and science engagement, again, which is for me like a segue, how to build trust in science. And the first study conducted in 2021 or 2022 by the Kafli Foundation um, has a nice sample size from close to 3,000 participants. Um, Again, it wanted to better understand how Americans' interests and engagement in science actually happens. And the numbers are great. It found that 94%, which is a really high number, according to the study, are interested in science. That alone is fantastic, right? Um, curiosity was one of the main factors. Um, curiosity means like, you know, how to spark imagination, and it's a, it's just a sense of wonder. Uh, mastery, you know, I want to gain knowledge uh, by myself and skills. Joy, it actually is fun to do science. It feels good, which is a super great factor. Autonomy, I can do it on my own. Um, this is where the biohacker, biomaker scene comes in, um, my personal reflection. And then also recharging. Um, science is a hobby for a couple of people. We just mentioned, like, you know, science, uh, communication outreach, right? It happens, like, you know, well, I have this iNaturalist app, and I see this bird, and I wonder what it is. So it is actually really great to do this in my own time, and it's physically, mentally, and emotionally recharging. Hopefully it's for a lot of scientists here in the room as well, right? I mean, I have fun doing science. Um, so interestingly, curiosity comes up um, equally across gender, race, ethnicity, income, geography, education, and political ideology. So the point I want to make here is um, curiosity is actually only one factor. It comes up across the border, right? Um, but when you like when you look at differences, it's drilling a bit deeper in the question if curiosity actually leads to engagement with science. And while there seems to be a clear correlation between curiosity and connection and willingness to engage, it really differs, at least you know, in the United States, according to the study, based on racial and ethnic groups. Um, white adults said, well, curiosity is my main factor. I just want to see how stuff works. Black adults reported it's actually a connection, a deep personal connection and being part of something bigger. And Hispanic adults said, well, it's a little bit of both. It's a mix between a curiosity and connection. And in other words, while curiosity seems to be a main factor, high curiosity actually doesn't really mean that we have effective engagement with science. So we really have to look like, you know, tailor our message every single time. Which leads to the question, who actually has access to science, right? And again, like 59% according to the study wanted to spend more time with science, which just means like 94% are interested. The majority wants to do more, right? And what are the barriers? What is actually like, you know, uh, keeping you away from like, you know, engaging with science? And again, science engagement ranged in from like, you know, reading articles, reading a newspaper, listening to podcasts. Uh, doing research in a free time to actually being part of a clinical trial, which if you have ever been part of a clinical trial, it's a huge investment of time. Even if you are compensated for your time, you have to get in multiple times over several years. So why are we not seeing more engagement? And it really like ranges from logistics to values, belonging, and identity. Like logistics, if you have a family of four and it costs you like, you know, 100 euros or dollars to go to a science museum, you might not be able to afford it very often, right? Especially in a time when everything gets more expensive. Um, some people also report, well, I don't see a value in going to a museum or read up on science. I, I really find it boring, or I don't understand what, what this is all about, right? So I'm just gonna turn to other means, which is actually more fun to, to follow, right? It could be social media. Um, some people said, you know, I feel uncomfortable asking questions about the topics I don't know about. How do we increase the confidence of people to partake, like in science, to ask questions, not being afraid to ask questions, not being afraid to like appear to be not like you know um, knowledgeable about science, and then identity. Science activities don't reflect contributions of people with background like mine, which loops into this is all about white old man. Um, I'm a young Latina in science. Why should I care, right? 
So the barriers, again, you see, like, you know, are variable. Some of them are easy to fix by adequate funding, right? Some of them are, like, harder to, like, you know, tackle. And the barriers related to feelings of belonging or identity, they have a greater impact, again, on the marginalized communities in America, for sure, like, which is African Americans and Hispanic communities. Um, and those demographics are, along with American Indian, Pacific Islanders, Hawaiian natives, and persons of disabilities. They're the same that have been historically been underrepresented in science. And we need them in science because we're missing them out in our STEM talent pools. So those barrier statements, they also tell for me the story that participation sometimes does not always indicate the absence of barriers, right? They might not even exist. But instead, they may be the result of an individual choice or work to overcome them. If you are Latina, again, engaging in science, and you make the time to sign up for a clinical trial, because for you personally, like, you know, it matters to represent, then you really have to think about this person had to put in twice the effort just to be there. And that's just the parting, starting ground. Okay, let's look to Europe. Uh, I think some people in this room actually might know this study. It also has been discussed like in the Austrian media a while ago. It's a famous special European study, 516, with more than 37,000 um, one-to-one interviews. It also came out um, as the previous study that I showed like in the middle of the pandemic, so in a time when like, you know, vaccines became available. And it's just the numbers, again, they are, for me personally, are promising. Because you see, again, more than 80% are interested in science and technology, and many of them want to learn more. So a great starting point. And respondents often mention, well, healthcare and medical care and fight against like, climate change um, when asked which areas of research and innovation can make a difference. Again, the first one is not surprising because this was done during the vaccine availability, right? You know, when all kind of like, you know, values were out there, uh, and climate change is just really like important for people, especially younger ones. And this is the same information, just showing since 2010, the last time the study was conducted, we do see a slight increase in European citizens' interest in science and feeling informed about science. So, however, interest does still not translate to feeling informed, but again, where we still see a gap, but, you know, interest in science, like, became bigger from between 2010 and the last time the study was conducted. So let's go to some more numbers, which I want to highlight here. So interest in medical discoveries increased in most member states. And the European average is like at 38%. Um, Austria, like you know, is at the lower half is 33%. Um, again, I want to point out we still had a 10% increase since that time which is, I think, very encouraging. And the highest ranking numbers are Portugal, um, Cyprus, Belgium, and Portugal was one of the lowest ranking countries just 10 years ago. Within 10 years, they actually saw a 55% jump. So uh, I think we can look deeper into what did, did this country implement and do, like what kind of strategies did they have? Because size and population-wise, we are not that different, right? Geography, of course, but there might be some lessons and take-home messages for us. And again, the same pattern can be seen here. This is the question about, like, you know, um, do you, would you like to learn more about scientific development? This is just learning, not engagement. And again, Austria, in Austria, only 11% would like to learn more about science, and it is, like, you know, 36% in Portugal. I did not include the numbers that you have the tendency to think about something, which is, like, the, the light blue, like, bar right above. Um, I just really was pointing to like, well, somebody's confident about what I would like to do this, which is like 11% in Austria. So, when the channel interest is like that low, because I personally think um, 11 out of 100 people being interested is not that high, especially if this study was done during the pandemic when the vaccine rollout was there. Um, how can the science community foster deeper connections with non-scientists? Because that's what you're talking about. And yeah, this is a huge topic. And I, I just want to bring up some major points here. Um, we also have a full day ahead of us, so please, like you know, um, discuss further and also find me to discuss further about some points. So I think, first of all, adequate funding um, is critical. Funding for science and scientific infrastructure so the scientists in Austria can do the best work possible. 
we just heard, like, you know, there's excellent research happening, but you only a quarter, like, you know, gets funded. So I think there might be some room of improvement here. But I also, like, see um, that you have um, some regulations here. Uh, it also includes, like, you know, uh, science education from kindergarten to university and beyond, science education in third spaces, which means outside of schools, you know, at innovative areas like, you know, empty, empty buildings, for example. And then also, like, it also includes, for me, institutional integrity. Then uh, the next one, which is like the cultural response of education, for me it's like tailored science communication that goes away from like, you know, I am a scientist, I have all the knowledge, and I will come to you and tell you something. This is like the parroting of like, you know, um, we have to close the gap. We need to have an honest and respectful dialogue. And I do understand that like, it's hard to get somebody talking to you when they don't like, you know, trust in science and believe. But again, sometimes you don't have to disclose that you're a scientist. You can have a common, like, you know, um, um, you can have a common conversation with somebody when you go fishing or when you just go to a farmer's market, right? You can always like do this kind of like tailored knowledge. Um, at the last Arit in DC, Dieter Prosa, and I think he's not here, he actually shared a really great example. Um, his um, university um, had, they had like vaccine trucks. They were planning to go out to the community. And instead of like the 500 people that wanted to vaccinate that single day, nobody, like literally nobody showed up. And that's a classic example of like, well, the community they wanted to serve, they didn't even speak English, they actually were using a certain specific Mayan dialect. So again, language barriers, we have to be mindful about how we reach out to those communities. I was also mentioned, like, you know, at Bayabas, I'm the PI of the New York City Virus Center, so it actually brings science and society together by empowering students to partake in pandemic preparedness by literally going out and sample wild birds for viruses, including influenza virus and Newcastle disease, which can have a huge economic impact in the future. And I dreamt up this um, program because the students were like, very frightened about what's happening, but they felt powerless and they wanted to be part of something, right? And then once they know and understand the scientific process, they can bring this back to the families. And a lot of them actually ended up as vaccine ambassadors because they understood like how a vaccine is made, but also like you know, how influenza can jump from wild birds to humans. Um, yeah, and then community science, which is just the example I shared, like you know, work with the community uh, and find that little aspect of your research that they care about. There's always something people wonder, especially if they're interested in science, there's always people some, some, always something that people wanna learn more about. And um, I do not wanna exclude like science journalism here because I think it's very important. Um, personally, there's this question, who should communicate science, right? Is it a journalist? Is it a scientist? I personally think it is the responsibility of the scientists to communicate science in a way, or at least like do the effort in a way that it actually can, you know, be understood by people. And um, that's like, you know, that support in high quality science journalism is sometimes very easy. But if you're a scientist and you have somebody like, you know, contacting you, make the effort, the five minutes, but just reading through an article that you get sent because you are the best in the field, you know if this is something you can just look further into, right? A journalist might spend hours just like trying to find out, you know, is this something to investigate further? So really make that effort. You can do this through social media, you can do an email, it can be a phone call, but I think it's just really it's very important. And yeah, scientists are also like super busy. I do understand this, but again, I think it's your responsibility to clearly communicate science and um, speaking to the press is only one way. You can also like, you know, turn to social media like we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, you can also do like speak to smaller groups, do science, comedy, or express yourself through art. Okay, so while doing so, uh, I wanted to remind scientists that, um, in the room that it is actually okay to make a statement that is correct today and which turns out not to be correct maybe tomorrow or in the near future. Because for me, that's, that is a tension point, right? We are a little bit afraid of like, well, I say something based on the current knowledge and then I do get criticized, right, or attacked by people because, well, why didn't you say it like yesterday, today, everything is like different. I think we, the more people like, you know, uh, again, it is a challenge to explain complex topics very simple in an adjustable way, but um, 
it's also like important to educate people or like you know invite people to understand more of, about the scientific process. And I do this every single day. I do it over and over again and do so cheerfully because the more people understand about the scientific process, the easier like building trust in science because they perceive you as transparent and honest every single time is going to work out. Okay, so let's say you are a scientist turning to social media to talk about your research, right? So where do people find information? Which is also, I think, it's um, something you have to really think about deeply. Um, while you're spreading word about your research, um, with the rise of digital technology, um, well, we all have our cell phones and we have all our apps installed, right? It actually works with certain algorithms. Um, it's no wonder that getting information through social media is actually really on the rise. And this trend is actually strongest in the most adaptable part of our society, which is our youth, or like even our teenagers or young adults. And teens today, they are not only getting the majority of information about social networks online, they're actually turning away from traditional media, which I think is something we have to consider when you are trying to convey your message and you're competing to influencers, celebrities, right, that actually might even uh, spread misinformation and information, how do we go about this? And even further, right, if those teenagers, they will grow up, right, and they're gonna probably not change the habit, they will cast a bellow. They will be our future, like, voters. So if there's no trust in science and democracy, like, you know, it's actually gonna have a real political impact. I would like to close out with something, again, that I mentioned, um, that really comes a lot up a lot in my work, and this is like the Article 27.1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. If you haven't read those recently, it's always a great read. <laughs> I give you permission to leave the room and look it up. Um, it's actually around since 1948 and actually really says science is a human right. The access to science is a human right. And um, we are all like, you know, have a right to share in the scientific advancement, it's also its benefits. And again, when I speak to especially marginalized communities, they wonder, is, is there a space for me in science? And then very often they hear, well, yeah, that, isn't that a human right? And it's around since 1948, and why, you know, I do still feel not being part of science. I think um, we can just bring this more to the forefront. And even, like, you know, brought this even further by Article 15 in the ICSCR that states, everyone has the right to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress and its applications. Which is like, you know, the implication is that governments must adopt measures to respect and ensure that si the right to science. And the existence of this right is important for researchers and for the society. It adds a legal and moral dimension to a range of fundamental issues, including scientific freedom, funding, policy, as well to the access to data, materials, and knowledge. So again, I close up with like science is everywhere and science is and should be for everyone. Let us make every effort to make it robust, inclusive and responsible. With that, I would like to thank you for your patience and if you need further resources, either take a snapshot of the barcode or find me over coffee and I look very much forward to, you, to talk to you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. I think it shows that there, is still, there are a lot of questions and there is still a lot of work ahead for all of us, be it scientists, be it politicians, or also be it us journalists, um, to communicate better, to communicate more, and especially like to find new ways of communication using uh, social media especially. I mean, there's a lot of great stuff out there, but of course there could be much more. Speaking of questions and discussions, it's time for our first panel discussion of the day. For that, I'd like to hand over the stage to Barbara Weitgruber. The topic is strengthening public trust in science through multidisciplinary perspectives. Barbara, the stage is yours. You'll introduce the speakers. And there will be times for, a time for discussions and questions um, after the first comments. Thank you. Um, 
the pres there will be no presentations, so actually we will focus um, on the discussion part. Um, let me start by introducing um, the three panelists. Um, and I would like to ask you to come to the stage after I've introduced um, all three of you. Um, Petra Hurtado is research director at the American Planning Association in Chicago, heading research programs and foresight practice. She's responsible um, for expanding future-focused research, advancing planning practices that assist communities in navigating change, and developing foresight practice to inform strategic governance. Her areas of expertise and research include urban sustainability, smart cities, emerging technologies, nature-based solutions, and environmental psychology. Prior to joining the American Planning Association, she worked as an advisor, planner, researcher, and educator in the urban sustainability arena. She received her PhD in urban planning from the Vienna University of Technology in 2013. She currently teaches at the University of Maryland as well as the Vienna University of Technology. She has lectured at Harvard Graduate School of Design, Loyola University, Chicago, and the Universidad Tecnológica Bolivar in Colombia. So we um, can look forward to very interesting discussions with her. Uh, Peter Nageli is head of the Department of Anesthesia and Clinical Care of the University of Chicago. He is a leading expert in pharmacology of anesthetic gases, and he has made significant contributions to the identification of mechanism of action of volatile anesthetics. Um, and uh, I leave the rest be out because not all of us are medical doctors, and I don't think that we would understand what I'm reading out. Uh, but he will talk about it. Uh, following his medical studies in Innsbruck and training at Vienna General Hospital in 25, he became associate professor at the Medical University of Vienna. In 2008, he became assistant professor and 2015 associate professor at Washington University in St. Louis. As a founding member and uh, former president of Astina, um, he rendered outstanding service to the bilateral scientific exchange between Austria and the U.S., as well as to the Austrian research community in North America. He is the recipient of numerous research awards and grants, um, and last October he was awarded the Austrian Cross of Honor for Science and Art, bestowed by the Austrian Federal President Alexander van der Bellen. Um, so he has seen both perspectives, and I'm sure in the discussion this is um, very important. And of course, he's coming from a field um, which um, suffered probably most during the pandemic um, regarding trust in science. Um, Sonja Schmidt is an associate professor of science and technology studies at Virginia Tech and currently co-director of the graduate program in DC metro area as well as an affiliate faculty member of the Nuclear Engineering Program and collaborates with faculty in the School of Public and International Affairs. She is particularly interested in examining the interface of national energy policies, technological choices, and non-proliferation concerns. Her most recent National, national Science Foundation supported research project focuses on the challenges of globalizing nuclear and emer emergency response. She won the Astina Young Principal Investigator Award in 2014 um, for her book, Producing Power, the Preaching Nobel History of the Soviet Nuclear Industry. She holds a Magister Phil from the University of Vienna as well as an MA from Cornell University, where she also received her PhD. At Virginia Tech, she teaches courses in social studies of technology, science and technology policy, sociocultural studies of risk, energy policy, and nuclear non-proliferation. She was a postdoctoral fellow in the Center for International Security and Cooperation at Stanford and at the James Martin Center for Non-Proliferation Studies in Monterey. So you can see we have a wide array of disciplines uh, and I look forward to having the three speakers on the panel now. So welcome them. Thank you. Um, I think um, Christine, with her uh, keynote, really set the stage um, for our discussion now. Um, 
focusing on, on various aspects of trust in, in science, uh, trust in democracy, um, also the question of uh, knowing about scientific uh, processes and reaching out uh, to communities. Um, so maybe it, uh, as a first question, or um, you, you come from very different disciplines, so you probably also have um, experienced um, this lack of trust um, or questioning in, in various ways. And I, I think we all agree um, that uh, science and research is all about being questioned and questioning everything on a daily basis. Um, but during the pandemic, um, this has become um, a different kind of mistrust um, in science. Um, so maybe, and I already said that medicine was, of, and the medical field was, of course, in the focus. Um, uh, we start um, with a short um, statement um, by you, Peter, um, on, on how you experienced it, um, and also maybe um, some mechanisms um, that could work or, or would work, or did work for you yourself. So um, thanks for the invitation. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so it is definitely true that, um, especially in medicine and during COVID, um, there was a huge reluctance of the general public to, uh, to get vaccinated and to accept and to, to understand also that uh, at that moment in time, um, you know, the, the governments, both in the United States, Austria and elsewhere, they tried to do the best with the information that was um, available at the moment, but it was so fast moving and I think we have never been in, in modern times been sort of exposed to such a pandemic. And so the target was always kind of moving and things changed on a weekly basis, sometimes daily basis. Um, I view the development of the COVID vaccine as one of the biggest uh, successes and milestones um, really in the, you know, since the end of World War II um, in, in biomedicine. Uh, but on the other hand, there is the, like you said, the mistrust of, of people um, and in social media was very active in spreading the mistrust across, across the globe. So we, we had to convince um, ultimately successfully to some degree, um, you know, that vaccines are safe and effective. Uh, but, you know, if, you, if you're in DC, you go to the mall, you see um, now there are more than one million Americans who have died of COVID. So that's the toll of the, of the COVID pandemic. So um, I, I can attest that this, this is true. I don't really know why, uh, to be honest. In the United States, I think there's an element of very conservative Christianism and, and really a uh, deep distrust in, uh, in, in medical research. Um, and that is maybe a little more unique to the United States than to Austria. Uh, but without a doubt, this really has cost lives. And one small comment to Austria, um, yes, you know, I was brought up in the Austrian medical environment. Um, the alternative medicine, complementary medicine in Austria um, has been actually supported and propagated by the Ärztekammer and by, because it's very lucrative, um, you can sell very small sugar pills and make a lot of money and there's a lot of, so there's never been really a, a I mean, there are, people have been trying, but there has been on the other hand, a very lucrative market in um, esoteric medicine, and it's very lucrative um, because people believe in simple solutions, and sometimes solutions are not simple. Thank you. Uh, Sonia, you come from a completely different uh, discipline. How did you experience um, also the, the past two years, and um, what is your perspective? So I cannot really speak to um, medical science, and I think this is uh, perhaps one nuance that I would add to Christina's um, earlier presentation, that um, the science communication always addresses the general public, but it also addresses other scientists, right? Scientists in different fields. So um, maybe I can say a little bit about uh, nuclear energy in terms of you know the, the changes that, ha that have occurred in that conversation um, both in terms of, you know, re-evaluating the contribution of nuclear in terms of climate change, but also uh, in the wake of the war in Ukraine um, and the cutoff in gas deliveries to Western Europe um, uh, and a possible re-evaluation of at least 
maintaining the existing nuclear power plants uh, in operation in, in countries that have them. Austria doesn't, doesn't have a, an operating nuclear power plant, as we know. Um, I, as, as you mentioned, um, I, I work closely with nuclear engineers, and they are, of course, very uh, excited about new reactor designs and nuclear new build, and they would like to, you know, um, expand nuclear. Um, and they're having a hard time understanding why the public, and even in America, the general public is, um, let's say, hesitant toward um, nuclear energy. Um, in other countries, as we know, it's more, like, hostile. Um, and these engineers have a hard time understanding why that is the case, because these new designs, these new reactor designs, are safer than the designs that currently operate, that were developed in the 1950s and 1960s, for example. Uh, we know much more about potential uh, disasters. We can prevent them better. We have better um, uh, preparedness and response capabilities today and after several severe accidents. So why is it impossible to get funding and get um, sustained support for, for, this, for this technology? And I think, for me, there's a, there's a link to the democracy question here. Um, do we as scientists, as engineers, believe that we have the true answers and the solutions that ought to be implemented? Or do we live in a democracy where non-scientists, non-specialists, non-experts ultimately have the last word and make the decision? It's, um, you know, I, I have a lot of policy students and I always tell them, you know, I'm an academic, I don't have to make those decisions, and I'm very happy about that. <laughs> because it's, it's tough, right? And you, you have to stand up for the decisions you ultimately make and that you, that you ultimately implement. The, the trust issue is um, not, you know, trust is this holy grail in science communication, but I think a healthy dose of distrust or, uh, um, you know, trust but verify this kind of, you know, uh, follow along closely what decisions are being made, what those decisions are based on, is actually a, 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 an outstanding feature of a democratic society that I would hate to, you know, go, <laughs> to see go. And um, um, so I'm, I'm an observer of this conversation, and it's very interesting to see, you know, the, the ongoing debate in Germany, for example, a country that has already made several... 180s on its nuclear policy. Um, I don't know where it's going to end up, uh, whether we decide to, you know, um, continue with the nuclear phase out, whether we decide to uh, maybe uh, continue operating existing nuclear power plants, or whether we go full out and build new nuclear power plants. This is complex, and I think uh, science and, and engineering does not operate in a vacuum. As we see, it's also a geopolitical, um, you know, balancing act. Um, what alternatives are out there, and what can be done at any given point in time. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Um, I think we will come back to, to some of the issues, especially um, the evidence-informed policy decisions. And um, having a former minister and a present minister in the room, I think um, they will certainly also then join into the discussion uh, later on, because that, of course, was one of the challenges um, also during the pandemic. Um, the, on the one hand, um, the advice um, and also sometimes the expectations of scientists and researchers um, that the advice should be taken on one-to-one, -one. and then um, the question of, as you said, um, in, in democracies, um, what is the process of, of decisions being taken? Well, um, coming to you now, um, also, again, um, for Beta, a completely different area, uh, but with similar challenges. Yeah, certainly. Um, so at APA, we're kind of seeing ourselves as the translator between science and practice in urban planning. So we work a lot with universities on research, but then we're trying to create guidance and tools for actual planners and how to work with those in their communities. Um, looking at the planning profession, um, we've been trying for many, many years and decades to really move from a top-down focused uh, profession towards bottom-up, so really close connections with the communities. And there's a lot of struggles, the way there's struggles talking science to communities, it's explaining planning to communities and, and 
that we're just really trying to, to do the best for the communities. So it's, it's a very, um, speaking of democratic processes, it's, it's kind of like a democratic process, and we don't always come with ideas and thoughts that the community accepts. And um, I would say planning in general in the U.S. is very interesting because it has a very bad reputation. Um, first of all, it's seen as the profession that creates barriers and um, zoning laws and regulations that give us restrictions on how we can move and act in the built environment. Um, but I would say with the last years with COVID, that reputation might have gotten even worse because we learned a lot of lessons. Um, we know now that our cities are not made for pandemics and our cities are not very healthy places. Um, we also learned that um, planning is not necessarily a, an agile profession. So a lot of these quick uh, solutions like shared streets and pop-up restaurant gardens were only possible because of emergency orders in these cities. Um, so usually a restaurant garden takes about a few months, if not a year, to get a permit for. Um, and because cities were under emergency orders, it was possible to do it. So, and then on top of all of that, with the murder of, murder of George Floyd and, and other uh, African Americans, um, a lot of inequalities that were actually created by urban planners surfaced during COVID. Um, practices like redlining or building highways that separated marginalized communities from other communities um, are all the work of planners. So. We're struggling not just with communicating our science to communities, but also actually doing our work in communities in a way um, that it's accepted and, and understood and um, that people feel involved and that they're part of the process. Yeah. Well, maybe just to, to follow up, um, have you found um, solutions? Have you found ways of doing it, um, of engaging communities? Yeah, so I think one big takeaway for us is, first of all, we feel like science isn't here to change opinions. Science is here to create outcomes. And um, what we really learned in these processes in these last few years was we need to meet people where they are. People are busy. They're burned out. There's a lot of mental health issues going on with COVID right now. And people just don't have time to look at what climate change means or where the vaccine was created and all these scientific questions. People just look for solutions so they can live a happy life. And that's really where we need to meet them. And as an example, um, I mean, planning is also very political and there are communities, there are states that where we just can't mention the word climate change. It's just, we're gonna have to leave the room if we do that. But we still want to figure out the outcomes that can help to uh, mitigate climate change and adapt to climate change. So we find other ways of communicating and finding the same solutions for other problems, looking at what are the problems that the people are facing, what are their pain points, and how can we get to similar outcomes by addressing those and not what we feel from our scientific perspective um, the problems are. Thank you. Um Social media was also mentioned um, as an important um, tool um, and as an important source of information for a large part of societies. Um, how do you deal with that? Um, and are, are there um, special ways of, of, of including um, social media in order to, to counteract um, misinformation? Peter. Um, so, without a doubt, um, there is very um, strong misinformation, and America loves conspiracy theories, right? Um, you know, you read about, like, JFK appearing here somewhere. It's like America, you know, um, it loves conspiracy theories. But, you know, I, um, when I was invited for this panel, I really thought, like, you know, we're not here just to commiserate, right? It's like, you know, how bad this is, how bad this is, but you, you come here for solutions, right? You, you want to hear what, what could be done to counter this, and I thought about this. So I, first of all, um, my, my diagnosis as a doctor is we live in a bubble. Um, we talk to uh, sort of amongst each others, and if you think about, you know, um, I really like your presentation, but how many people in, in, in Austria uh, listen to your hands? The, the folks who you want to reach don't listen to your hands. Uh, they don't. 
um, and they may not watch tip two, uh, tip two, eh? um, <laughs> um, they don't. We need to reach out to the folks we want to reach, and it starts actually at schools. So here's my, here are my thoughts. Um, you know, it is science, research in general, has become ever more complicated. Um, it is, it is um, even for, you know, for me, trying to understand even basic discoveries in, in biomedicine is often very difficult. Um, so my suggestion is to focus on the people, the scientists. Make science cool. Um, and so it is, um, we know in Austria, everyone, alle Fußballspieler, Skifahrer, Formel 1, everything, <laughs> everything. You know, you, if I ask, you know, Anatovic in Bologna, I think, you know, last goal, is like everyone knows this, right? We know everything about the Fußballer, jeden Zweitliga club, everything, everything. But we have world famous scientists, innovators, entrepreneurs who are unknown. So I make one prediction. Um, there will be a Nobel Prize in medicine or in, you know, or in chemistry uh, for optogenetics. It is um, they, the t sort of last year's LASCA uh, award went to the team for optogenetics. So I, I think there's a 100% probability within the next five to 10 years there will be a Nobel Prize for optogenetics. Do you know that there's an Austrian among, in the running? There's an Austrian in running who, is, who won a lot of the prelude awards and um, you probably never heard of him. That's embarrassing. It's really embarrassing. You know, you know um, as I said, old Fußballspieler, Ole. But scientists, even world class scientists, you don't. Gero Miesenberg is his name. And so he is one of the five who has a le legitimate chance. And he's actually from my, my neck of the woods, where I was born. We went to the same medical school in Innsbruck, and unknown. That's embarrassing. So, so you, you, if you make science cool, then use people and say, because the, the joy of discovery, you can actually do this in, um, in, in you, you can start in, in the school. You should tell the stories, tell the stories about people, Austrian ingenuity, and, and, and not focus on the sort of the science, because what is taught in middle school and in high school are all the, the scientific facts. Tell the stories about the people. So um, anyone know the name of Ole Honikiewicz? One. <laughs> so he, he's another guy who is actually um, his son. So he's, he's an uh, Ukrainian immigrant. Um, he died at the age of 92, I think, last year. Um, he came during World War II. He, he, was, he, was, he, he basically discovered dopamine for Parkinson. So this was at the, medical, uh, the University of Vienna, virtually unknown. There were, there were basically reports written about him that he should have, there was a Nobel Prize for Parkinson's and dopamine, and he was overlooked. Unknown. So there are numerous people uh, in Austria, and it's not just in the medical field, that are unknown to the public. So if you wanna, um, there's a, there's a, I, I like the saying, um, or the, um, I, I say it in German, um, if you, um, Lehre den Menschen nicht Schiffe zu bauen, sondern die Sehnsucht nach dem weiten großen Meer. I think this is Saint Exupéry. And if you want to make, if you want to establish trust in science, start at the school and tell the stories about really cool Austrian scientists, and I think you will win the battle. Thank you. Um, I think we will open up sooner than foreseen in the program to the public because um, I think there might be some examples um, how it could already work. Um, go ahead. Social media, yes, uh, just very briefly. <laughs> um, I, I, I think that's a, that's a great idea and I, I support that totally. In addition, I would say um, media literacy is at least as important as scientific literacy. In other words, what is a source? What is a trustworthy source? Where can I go to find information on a topic? And is a TikTok movie really <laughs> trustworthy and credible and, uh, and something that I, that I should believe or not? That is something that we can also teach in, in schools starting very early. This is entertainment. Here are the ways you can, you can find who is behind this discovery or, you know, um, uh, who, who made this movie and who, um, where to go for, for, 
for actual information. So the, the, and this is something that actually probably not just children would benefit from, but what is a trustworthy source? The, the kind of media literacy is, is really important in a democratic society, um, and that's one thing that journalists could really help scientists out with by, by you know, advocating for, for good and trustworthy sources. Thank you. And you yourself, do you actively use social media to convey uh, messages? I personally don't, no. Yes, of course. One quick sort of follow-up comment um, that I forgot. Um, it is, so I have two sons, um, you know, both are, one is 16, one the other is 18, and I am really sort of mad because they don't read books. Um, they read books that are basically told them to, you know, they, they need to read in school, but their level of knowledge in many ways is like, holy moly. So one suggestion for you at the Österreichische Akademie der Wissenschaften, at the Wissenschaftsministerium, at the universities, have sort of media offices, and what they need to produce is YouTube videos. YouTube, okay? Kids now learn by YouTube or videos. So no one is going to read, you know, a 20-page article about theoretical physics. But if you tell them, you know, on, on a 10-minute YouTube video how cool this is, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll win. It is, it is a complete game changer. I did not believe this. So every institution who wants to sell needs to produce videos. So it's, and you know, us in science and research, it's actually, to do this sort of professionally to, to, and not embarrass yourself, it takes a, actually some effort, right? But, but actually, in, in terms of, you know, I think you need to change your media offices from just written to videos. And you should, st you should start it yesterday, to be honest. I did not believe this, but that's the way of the future. Kids learn by video. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, I can only second this, and uh, we actually tried that out at APA um, because we realized some of our research projects take three years. Well, then you research for three years, and then you have a nice paper, 20, 50, 100 pages, however many, much content we have, and then no one reads it. At the same time, in those three years, we um, conducted interviews with experts that could easily be recorded as a podcast something that Gen Z and others enjoy listening to. Um, we can write quick blog posts. We can post on Facebook. We can make TikTok videos. I haven't tried that yet, but who knows? Maybe they're going to make me do that soon. Um, so again, meeting people where they are in younger generations, especially are not in the library maybe, but they are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever else is out there. So that was one of the things that we changed on how we share our knowledge and the things that we research really throughout those years, um, sharing more micro content uh, before we come out with a macro content, the paper. Um, but then again, one thing that I mentioned earlier, meeting people where they are, you mentioned bubbles. We all live in bubbles. And I also sometimes think there's also a science bubble. Because the question is really, do we want to get the information out that a wonderful Austrian person um, had a great idea and uh, changed the world with it? Or do we want to talk about how this change helps the person live a better life? And um, I don't know if it matters for Gen Z if that scientist is from Austria or anywhere else. I don't know if patriotism is a thing for Gen Z. Um, so I'm just really thinking if we want to meet people where they are, we need to address their pain points and give them solutions for their pain points, um, no matter if it's science or not. Thank you. I, I think meeting people where they are is, is uh, probably one of the takeaways um, we already have, and, and everyone agrees. The question is how, how to do it, um, and there are probably different options. Um, I know that there is a microphone also um, for, the, for those in the room, um, and maybe... Um, we get it now um, so that we can already bring in um, the audience um, for comments. Uh, maybe you, some have uh, best practice examples on how you already do it. So the floor is open for questions and comments. Who is the icebreaker? Yes. Yeah. And, and please hello. identify yourself. Hello, hello. Press the button. Pressed it. Hello? Do you hear me? 
Okay, yes. Hello. My name is uh, hello. My name is Dietrich Haubenberger. I'm from um, I'm a uh, neurologist uh, trained at the medical trained at the University of uh, uh, Vienna. Then did my uh, uh, residency at the medical university. I'm now here um, in the U.S. since 2008. Um, I have the pleasure to lead the Astina network, and I work personally in the pharmaceutical industry now in the clinical research area. Um, one point that I can probably, as an experience from my own um, experience, bring in here is when I made, uh, when I submitted my green card application, as uh, you know, on, on scientific grounds, I had to submit um, my publications and my 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 citations. Basically, my impact was. Uh, as, a, as, as an important uh, or established researcher was, was evaluated based on citations, but not just uh, by the scientific literature, but the lay media. Basically, my lay media citations were equally important as I submitted my standing as a scientist here, here to, to, to be accepted you know, for a green card. So that really um, you know, made me think about that, some of the discussion that we had yesterday about how, how can you measure impact, how can you measure... Um, how can you, uh, you know, measure impact of your scientists? How can you measure impact of, 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 of your institutes, really, to go beyond uh, the scientific literature, see how, how, how to quantify, how to measure impact of your scientific discoveries in the general population, in, in the lay media, and, and make that really a, you know, a way how to, how to you know, train your scientists to not only do your research work, but also to explain it to your peers. We are good at that but uh, not really to the general public, who is essentially responsible to pay you and to invest in you. So I think this he here as a scientist in, in North America, you really have to essentially you know, provide your own money for your research. You have to convince um, foundations. You have to, you have to, you have to speak in, in very simple terms why your research matters, right? Um, so I think this is, this is something that is, that is also important to bring into the education of our, of our young scientists. Probably one, one example that I have, uh, speaking of YouTube, Astina has a YouTube channel. We started that more or less out of, out of necessity during COVID because it was not possible to meet in person. Um, our YouTube channel, um, you know, somewhat uh, uh, blew up uh, in a positive way, uh, to a certain way. We have, you know, one of our videos we just looked has 58,000 uh, um, uh, views on, on Neanderthals. That's really exciting. So people come, people look. We have, we have examples of YouTube videos that made it into the, into the, into the regular scientific uh, literature now. We have, cite, we, have, we, have, we have papers that cite you, uh, 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 virtual talks that were given there. So it's there. It's both the scientific community and also the lay community is open for, for, for new avenues. Thank you, and, and thank you also um, for bringing in the topic um, on the, the, the impact um, and what is measured, um, what researchers do, because this is actually a discussion that has started, as I mentioned, in the European Union as well. Um, the, the research assessment, um, looking at all the different outputs that um, research um, and researchers and scientists um, can have, and um, how that should also actually be reflected in, in recruitment um, in incentives, uh, because of course, if there are no incentives um, for researchers and scientists, um, or no awards um, for other parts of, of, of their work than being cited in, um, in, in publications, um, then it's also challenging, of course, to, to have this mind change. So it's a, it's, an, it's a discussion that's actually going on now in, in Europe, and it, it's great to see that um, some of it has already taken place in the US. Um, so maybe that's also a, a, something where the Astina network um, can actually um, give input um, in the discussions we, we have in, in Europe. Um, I already see a, a second one, and then we come back to the panel. Hello. Press the button. No, I'm good. So my name is Elvira Welzig. I work with uh, AWS. Um, I see a couple of um, entry points that are way earlier before we hit the top-notch scientists that may be, as presented, um, very hard to approach. Uh, in Austria, we have the Vorwissenschaftliche Arbeit. That's probably is pre-scientific as in its name. But maybe we give the opportunity to pupils, students, um, to learn how to tell others, their grandparents, their siblings, anyone around what they're doing and what they did with the first structured project tackling certain topics. 
And then I see bachelor students and master students who cannot convene what they did in their master thesis. Um, so maybe that could be taken up in um, their education uh, in order to make them able to, you know, get the word, spread the word to the families, the friends who might not be within the system um, and not at the high level that might be a little unapproachable. Just my five cents here. Well, I think we did spark the interest now. Um, <laughs> Heinz Fassmann is next. Yes, thank you. This was an interesting uh, morning session. Um, and I have two, let's say, um, opposite impressions. One impression is after, after listening to Barbara Weidgruber, Ursula Jakobek, Jakob Kalice, that's a wonderful time for scientists. Um, we have record numbers everywhere. 3.2% uh, uh, research money measured by GDP. There are new possibilities in the FVF to apply for research, new possibilities in the ORD. Um, I'm sure that Minister Polasik will, will, will get a record budget um, for, our, for our sector. So wonderful time. Why we are complaining? <clears throat> Christine said to us, there are 86% of the people are interested um, in, in research and science. That's a wonderful number. Um, Peter Nagele spoke about the, the bubbles. Yes, we have bubbles, that's clear. And there will be a bubble with 14% which are anti-scientific orientation. That's clear, we are living in a fragmented or pluralistic society and not everyone has the fantastic sympathy for science as we all have. Um, so my, my, my point is, um, are we, um, sind wir übertrieben? Are we exaggerated in our expectations? It's not possible that everyone um, um, loves science as we have. That's clear. Uh, nevertheless, we should, we should try to convince people um, about the value of science. Um, we should go into class. Uh, we should bring scientists into classrooms. Uh, we should communicate in a way that the people are understand us. But nevertheless, I think we are living in a, in a, in a time which is very, very good for, for scientists. I read an interesting book from Alexander Bogner, uh, it's called The Epistemisierung des Politischen. You can translate it, I cannot do it. <laughs> and his, his main thesis is, if you observed everything in the political um, arena is now uh, scientifically argued. We are arguing and say um, um, vaccination is good because. And the other ones arguing and said, also in a very scientific terms, um, um, vaccination, the, the proof of vaccination is not enough for me. Or we don't know how, how are the long-term effects. But it is in scientific argumentation um, and not in non-scientific argumentation. So if I bring my observ observations together, I would say uh, a good time for us, a good time for ARIT, and a good time for science and research. Thank you so much um, for, yeah, it, it's the, the question of the glass being half empty or half full, and it's definitely more than half full, and, and we are looking at the missing part, or focusing on, on the missing part. Um, could you take the mic over here? Hi, I'm Uta Stadelboer from the Vienna Business Agency, and I think, well, it's an interesting scope of, um, I think, topics that are up here. I believe that regardless of the fact that um, there is a very high acceptance of science and it's, um, um, the budgets are um, apparently as good as ever, um, it's very important, I totally agree with Peter Nagele, that um, 
and, and the panel that you get um, the touch points to the audience or to the young people um, through different initiatives and to get um, the accept or to increase the uh, acceptance of science. I mean, we at the VBA, we do it through things like um, the so-called research fees that is happening now where we go to schools and um, we tour through schools and try to reach um, students um, who, are, um, who don't have access to science. Um, through um, due to their backgrounds, basically, or not, it's not that accessible. Um, however, there's a lot of spotted initiatives um, that try to reach very young students and their families. Um, and I think um, some of the budget would have to go into communication matters because social media, TikTok, the way young people communicate and how they gain information is something that is... Um, it's not a side thing that will um, go away. Um, I think that science has to kind of reassess the way that you communicate with, um, with the audience and the young people because um, this is crucial. So I think this has, there has to be put more effort into that. So I agree with that. Um, this is important to think about. Thank you. May I invite the panel now to, to comment on the comments? Peter, so, please. Again, um, I'm trying to be concrete, you know, and, and, and sort of think about sort of solutions. Um, there is, so for instance, like in, in um, middle school, high school, so in gymnasium, um, you can teach, for instance, their basic, basic concept of, let's say, neurotransmission. A nerve transmits signals, right? But you can also, in the, in the, in the same book, have an article, a, a small, like, field that Otto Löwy, Österreich Nobelpreisträger an Uni Graz, did this. He was instrumental in identifying acetylcholine to, to, to transmit nerves. So on the one hand, you, you basically have in the school book just facts, how it's done, and then you have the person who did it. And you make suddenly that person, this, that, that, that sort of that student in Graz, in the Graz Steiermark, you make them proud that this was someone at the university who did this, right? Boltzmann, you've been in a Boltzmann Gasse, who is Boltzmann? Eh? You know, ask in the average Austrian, they have no clue, right? But this was a fundamental physicist, right? So if you tell stories about the people, what they did at the place, right? Then you, you suddenly, you, you, instead of like transmitting facts, you not only tell a story, but you say, this was one of us, right? You know, so I, I give an example, right? So I'm originally kind of identify myself as a, from Salzburg, um, and <laughs> I like Red Bull Salzburg, and, you know, and they were, you know, Ewing Haaland was, was for two years in Salzburg, right? I still follow this guy, right? And, and so it's like crazy. So, so that connection, that pride, and there's so much to be proud in Austria, there is, but, um, but the, the vast, I would say the, 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 the white population just does not know about all the individuals who made Austria great, other than the Shiva. Um, I'd like to go back to uh, Christina's uh, presentation about, and also what um, um, Mr. Fassmann said about, you know, the, the excitement, the curiosity um, about science. Those are expressed preferences, and that's a problem with these surveys and how the, how the questions in such, such surveys are being framed. It's great that, you know, 86 or whatever percent um, are curious about science, but how many of those people are actually willing and, and are going to engage with science? A fraction. So these numbers, in a, in a way, are meaningless un unless we, we really want to get rid of those barriers and enable people to participate. And that happens you know, through, through various engagement processes and, and, and programs. Um, that, that then will give us a, a, a more realistic understanding of, of who is actually willing to participate in science. And the rest needs to understand where to go to for accurate, trustworthy information. And that can happen by identifying people, by identifying institutions, and by identifying relationships that are accountable um, and, and trustworthy. The, the whole trust issue is not so much about content, it's about relationships. It's about who can I trust that they're telling me the truth and that they will be accountable for what they're telling me. And if that truth changes, as happens in science, then 
that's okay because I trust that person to always tell me where they are at the moment and give me the best possible information they have. I agree with everything that Sonia just said, and I would add something to it um, because I feel like communication is also about empathy. And um, I would really say when we communicate science, we need to be aware of um, who we're talking to and what the purpose is of our communication. Um, we have different audiences to address, um, and I would say if we talk about science in schools, a lot of the purpose is also to recruit the future scientists and to make science cool so we have you know, people who follow us and uh, create the next uh, great inventions and innovations of the future. Um, but it will be probably a different communication than when we talk to a single mother with three kids who is working two jobs or the farmer who's worried he might lose his um, farm the next year. Um, when we want to convince them to take a vaccine. So I think it's the purpose and really the putting ourselves in other people's shoes, practicing empathy when we communicate science. Maybe um, framework conditions. Um, because, of course, um, in order to be able to reach out, um, depending on also the stage in your career, I mean, Sometimes you can decide yourselves um, how to focus um, and, and what time of your, your work time you will spend on outreach activities or communication activities. Um, have you experienced, um, and you, you were all at, at very different places, both in Austria and the US, um, have you had, well, a model or a place where you, you really felt that it was um, empowering the activities you were doing also in, in the outreach, that it was seen as something um, worth being done by a, a scientist, a researcher, um, an employee? Or was it just um, the add-on that you did uh, because you were convinced that's part of what you should be doing? <laughs> You're looking to me. So um, I, I would say there, there are two aspects. One is um, it is in the interest of the institution uh, of the university, of the institute, you know, the department, to promote um, innovation, discovery, and and its people. Um, so that's and it's it's that's promotion, right? It is and it's very important. Um, and it's a game that's played every day. Um, you know, getting you know into newspaper and 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 sort of media. Um, so that's that's um, I think a lot of institutions do this quite well. Um, but you know, the market, the readership is. Not huge, right? Um, it is it is um, a small percentage of the population who would follow sort of you know the sort of science and discovery media uh, faithfully. Um, but on the other hand, you know there there is uh, we have to so that's the what's current, right? Current innovation, current discovery. Uh, but going back what I said before, I I think there's a huge knowledge gap um, of you know what is what 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 we have either not learned or forgotten what, you know, the people who walked us, you know, before us, right, standing off the shoulders of giants. Um, again, one example from, uh, you know, in, in Vienna. Um, you know, Vienna um, in 100 years ago was really the mecca of medicine, um, modern medicine. It was, you know, uh, without a doubt, um, you know, like surgeons, uh, for anyone who's ever been in the Gesellschaft der Ärzte, I think in the, uh, in, in the in this building, you walk in and you see, you know, busts um, of all the famous, you know, surgeons and, and doctors, you know, who, and I would say the vast, vast majority of Austrians don't even know. Bilderbold, for instance, you know, uh, one of the most famous surgeons uh, who has ever lived, you know, is there. So, so I think, so there are two aspects, right, uh, catching up with um, maybe more historical, you know, uh, the, the, the history of science, um, and then also the, the current media outreach of, of new innovation. Um, and that, that, the latter one, I think most in institutions do well, fairly well. So your question was, how do we incorporate outreach? Is that? Well, I mean, the ins more also in the institutional framework that is provided, because, um, of course, some institutions might have structures in place. Um, others will just um, let you do it. 
um, but not encourage it, or maybe it's just something you do it for a personal choice, but it's not part of uh, the portfolio. Yeah, I, I have to say I disagree with Christina that we should do our own uh, press work and, and uh, journalistic work. I believe in the division of labor. I am not a good journalist, and I don't want to be a journalist. I want to do my job well, and I'm happy to talk to journalists who then can translate and do their job really well. And I believe in relationships and building relationships with journalists who then can do it all the better the more they know me or they know my, my work. Um, but I think there's a, you know, there's a, there's a difference in what, what we are after. I have the privilege of being able to ask questions and to question everything and to be super critical. A journalist may have a completely different, you know, task at hand, which is either to convince people to fund something or, you know, to convince people to be interested in something. So let's just you know, <laughs> keep our own little territories uh, intact. And if we want to go outside, you know, our, our own territory where we feel comfortable, then so be it. And some people are better at that. I mean, you're clearly very good at that. <laughs> but others may not be, right? And, um, and I think there's a, there's a reason for why we choose different jobs. Um, I think um, we need the micro no microphone now for Eva Stenzel, the journalist, um, being in the room. Uh, and maybe also, Christine, as far as I understood, um, you were not um, advocating that all researchers and scientists should become journalists, but they should talk to journalists. And that's what you are actually doing, um, so that the journalists don't have to read through the articles and, and try to understand themselves, but get the information. Um, Eva, please. Um, hello, um, I'm Eva Stanzl. I'm um, a science journalist for Wiener Zeitung, which is um, the oldest newspaper in the world. Um, and I'm also the president of the Austrian Association of Science Journalists. And um, no, <laughs> we, it, it is not our job to try and convince people of something. I mean, this, is, this might be the job of a commentary or a political commentator, but a science journalist... Um, is usually trying to report on very complicated issues um, on different topics every day um, in a way that people would understand. And so this is what we, this is how I understand the job. And um, I think what would be fruitful um, to help science communication, or help people to understand science, is, is, is a good collaboration between scientists and journalists, um, and a clear communication by the scientists. This would pro is probably how I would see it, um, or at least it's easiest to work with scientists who are good communicators. And so I believe that it entails a whole system of um, educating scientists to become good communicators, educating journalists to um, write more clearly or to use new different revolutionary forms of media. Um, and I think probably one of the hardest things in my job would be to communicate the truth of science or the, the results of complicated scientific research on a two-liner on TikTok. Um, this is one of the big questions we face on how to do it. Um, yes, this is it. Thanks. Thank you. There is a question or a comment in the last vote. So what I wanted to ask is, um, we talked about how we can um, convince or get children in, in a very early educational stage to expose to science and maybe also critical thinking uh, via the kinder university where they get exposed to academia. But what I think what could be a, um, a challenge, I would say, is how to convince my parents or my grandparents of critical thinking because they, were ne they never had the opportunity to be exposed to ac the academia field and to science. And they also, they don't only lose the trust in science, maybe also in the media. And now we talked about how the collaboration between journalism and science is important, but how can I get the trust of those people in both fields because they want they don't get the information through newspaper anymore they maybe use facebook and i think yeah i i just wanted to point out like that maybe there is a challenge to to face thank you maybe 
could you just um, tell us um, who you are? And oh, yes, where sure. You're I'm, a, I'm a master scien scientist um, at Harvard Medical School and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and I'm funded by the Marshall Plan Foundation. Thank you. Back to the podium. Who would like to go first? Yes. Yeah, so I think one thing um, that I've seen is um, obviously we need to try to bring science and practice a little closer together. And I think museums have been doing a really good job in this, at least some museums, where you can actually apply things at the museum, try things out, especially te technical museums do that a lot. That kind of makes you be part of something or understand something better if just reading about it doesn't do it a job. Um, I can tell you a fun story uh, that just happened this week. I had the honor to travel to Nebraska, Kearney, Nebraska, a 20,000 people community, um, and to give a talk about the future of agriculture, which included lab-made food, 3D printed salmon and beef, um, NASA's uh, collaboration uh, on agriculture and outer space. Um, I'm alive, I survived, <laughs> I'm here. Um, but so, obviously that raised a lot of questions in the audience. People were looking at me like, okay, what does that mean for the future of my work? What does this mean for the future of my farm? What does this mean for the five kids that I have at home that I need to feed? And so in addition to that presentation, I did a workshop with the group there and we started working on how can you prepare for this future? And so then everyone got much more interested in, ooh, I should really read about this and ooh, can you share that website with me? And where can I find more about this lab-grown stuff because maybe we can collaborate with the local university in Lincoln, Nebraska. So applying things and having people try things out might bring it closer to them and that might actually spur critical thinking that might not have been a part of their lives before. Peter, would, any comments? Um, well, m maybe one thought. Um, and this is, this is sort of informed by, uh, by my regular practice when I'm in the operating room. So, you know, every patient, before a patient has surgery, they need to uh, go through what's called an informed consent. I understand this again. Um, do you know what the reading level, the goal is for the reading level to inform patients in the U.S.? What's the goal? Sixth grade. Sixth grade. So this is, this is, zweite, uh, dritte Klasse, Hauptschule. This is the reading level and the comprehension level of what's considered the general public. So that you can reach most patients and make it understand. So this means if, if, an average person at that level will not understand a single word that Eva uh, would write in Standard or in Wiener Zeitung, nothing. It's completely lost. It is hieroglyphs. It's, it's foreign. It's like if you look, uh, you just do not understand the concept. So if we, again, if we, if the audience is important, right? If we want to educate the, the general public, we need to speak at the level of the general public. And this is sixth grade level. So this means whatever we want to communicate needs to be at that level. Um, on Facebook, on, on, on TikTok, it has to be short, right? Anything longer than, I don't know, three minutes or five minutes is too long. The attention span is short. So this forces us actually to communicate briefly and succinctly. So if we want to reach the white, the, white, sort of the white public, we need to, and I hate to say this, dumb it down. We need to be at the sixth grade level. Otherwise, we will have lost them. We will, we've not lost them, we will not reach them. So that's something that we need to keep, need to keep in mind. If we want to educate a wider, a wider group of people, we need to make it very, very easy to understand. Sonia, and then I have, I think, four more, um, at least I've seen four more hands in the audience. No? Um, you were first, or at least I saw you first. It's kind of difficult against the light, um, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my name is Bernhard Gruber. I'm uh, at the Mass General in Boston. Uh, since many years, uh, during the pandemic, I was at the medical, uh, uh, medical university in Vienna. Um, and and um, I've been following this, this discussion since quite some time. Um, so the, the citizen science program, which is established in, in, in Austria, is kind of a, a successful route. Um, what I was questioning by myself is, as a researcher, where do you, or 
where do you get the time or pick the time to really do this properly? I mean, you, you have to get out, you have to get up your CV, you have to get papers out, you have to get up reputation, and to at some point in history where you'd be lucky enough to get a permanent position to not anymore think about where do I get the money from to feed my kids, right? So this is some, or most of the people in the room don't have to think about anymore, I guess. Um, and that is a question, where do you pick the time then to communicate everything to a community, to a broader community? Most of PhD students are doing this in, in mock solutions, so massive open content or whatever. So there's a lot of solutions out there. YouTube is pretty good. And uh, on that topic, I think there's, we have to get it in front of the wave in, in terms of what is the newest or the hottest shit out there that we should jump on, right? This is one solution, but the question is really to me, where do you pick the time to get this done? I mean, as an engineer, I'm an engineer researching in magnetic resonance technology. Um, I also feel kind of as an, as an observer, right? <laughs> and this is where, where to teach it. So um, I'm coming from a small town in, in Austria originally. Um, when I go back to Austria, I usually participate in traditional Stammtisch or whatever in, in Austria. So when was the last time you have ever been to such events in your hometown where you originated and just talked about what you have done, not in complicated words like you're writing it in journals on 10 pages or whatever, or you communicate with colleagues. Um, when have you done that? The last time that you talked with a, a Maurer or, or any, any, any Tischler or, or farmer or whatever, doesn't matter. That's the question. When was the last time you talked with such a person about what you are doing? You can think about it while I take the other comments. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Um, I agree with Peter that we have to be visual in how we communicate science. Do you remember how Julia Child made the French omelet on television? That demystified cooking, that broke down barriers, that made it accessible. That is what started teaching the American public about actual good food, yeah? She demonstrated it on television. So what I'm thinking about and what I really observed also, poor Dr. Fauci had to suffer that, is the process of science, right? It's a process, it's a discovery, it's a journey. And as we learned about what's necessary, are masks necessary or not, sort of as we learned more about the COVID pandemic, it is, we, the, the public experienced the changing information as a failure of science rather than understanding that it is a process they are participating in. It's a process that's usually opaque. So I think it actually makes sense to include this process, open it up to the general public because it brings humility into the process. We don't have firm answers. Yes, a patient goes to a doctor and wants to be reassured, but a doctor who also says, you know what, I need to look into this more, I need to understand more, actually engenders trust. So that's why it's like not to have the ambition to have the firm answers or bring the result to people include them in it. It makes it more accessible for young people, for everybody, right? Like we can all like, yes, I can be part of this journey. It makes sense. So that means it's like, it's not, people, people perceive science as an ivory tower, right? I don't understand the language. Nobody looks like me, essentially. It's like, what place do I have? But if I understand that this is something that starts in small bits and pieces, not in the museum, but also outside, that I can be part of. I think that really could make a difference. Point number one, briefly point number two, talking about picking up people where they are. In this country, communities of minorities were targeted with experimentation, right? So there was a lot of abuse that happened here at the hands of science and scientists, government scientists. That needs to be addressed. The black community was not interested in vaccination. We know the history of this. Right? So that was not sufficiently addressed. 
rolling back to, I'm sorry, I omitted that. My name is Alexandra Lieben. I am um, chapter head of Astina Pacific South, and I'm a social scientist. That means I deal with emotions and imperfect people. Thank you. Thank you. I know that there are two more, but there is an immediate comment um, from the panel. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I agree with what you just said, and I, I would like to add something, and that is we mainly talked about sciences here on the panel that we believe make good things in the world, but there's other things that are happening in research, like, for example, artificial intelligence, where we do research with good intentions, but one thing that also is usually not the responsibility of the researcher and will later maybe be perceived as that is what about the consequences of the things that we innovate? Because we don't have the ability to control what people do with our innovations, and that's a big discussion right now around, for example, topics like artificial intelligence. Um, science creates it, but what does the user do with it? And does that fall back on science, that it wasn't used in equitable, sustainable ways by the user? Thank you. Um, in the back, um, thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Manuel Schrempf. I'm simply a high, stu high school graduate and I'm he here today for, uh, for the Mold Walter Monk Foundation. Um, I'm very honored to be here. Uh, and first of all, I just wanted to, to try to understand. You all talk about making science cool, making science understandable for people, but I tried a lot. I mean, back in school, all of my classmates, they used to come to me when they had questions. I know I honor myself a lot about that, but I realized at one point that people are simply not interested in science. I realized it, and I also wrote my diploma thesis about uh, microplastics in alpine lakes together with Erich Theo and Matthias Heinzel, and I saw other colleagues, um, class colleagues, and they did also great research on different topics, and simply they, they stopped being interested in it. After they got their grade, it was forgotten. And so I'm asking you, what do you believe is the science behind science? That is my question. Thank you. Thank you. Very good question. Um, in the middle now, the, yeah? Thank you. My name is Irene Meyer. I'm a chemist by training, and I see a lot of great scientists here. And I want to point out that, of course, uh, we are missing some information about safety regulations, all the regulations we need to face on top of communicating our science. It's a lot about outreach now, about trust in science. But the experts, uh, they have to pay attention to um, discrimination to safety issues, uh, how to contribute the science to community, how to apply science for uh, the benefit to the community. And uh, it's really a very, very hard job and it needs um, uh, policy and scientists to work together. And it has to be a very high standard um, uh, for all of us in order to be safe on this and in order to proceed and for the best of our um, children and our next generation. And I see uh, that it's very, very important uh, to uh, point out training and education here. Of course, it's science on the one hand, but it's also training on the other side and experience um, and um, scientists uh, are hopefully the best in training, and I think that needs to be pointed out by journalists as well. Uh, that it's nice that I can read about um, the clinical trials of medication myself in the internet, but if I wanna get 
good uh, opinions on what medication is best for me, then I should believe that I can talk to a medical doctor and that he knows best and that he knows where to get the information from. So I think education is very, very important and adding in science. Thank you. I have um, the colleague in the back and then Minister Polaschek. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ulrike Dudak. Um, I'm trained as a physicist. I taught um, in high school in Innsbruck, in gymnasium, and now I'm working in um, magnetic resonance imaging um, <laughs> as a professor at Purdue. So um, one thing that, we, that I just heard a little bit here, and I, this is a fascinating conversation here, and I took a lot of points, and I think there's a lot of... Com um, a lot of things that span the range. I mean, we haven't talked about trust, trust in science. So, yes, getting people engaged in science, getting people access to science, all of that is really important, but there will remain the people that are not necessarily wanting to learn more about it, but they, we still want them to trust in the scientific facts. And I do think we talked about the bubble, and I really like Peter Nagel's suggestion about, you know, making history of... and. and putting names and people behind it. But we should not only put names of famous people behind it and make science keep this, this mystic um, thing that, that is for famous people that have invented wonderful things, but to make them aware that maybe their neighbor has done something. Maybe this high school kid has done something. That scientists are just normal people. And I noticed from, from teaching that when I tell my students that, oh, this person invented this, when they were your age, like they were a PhD student at the time, just makes them fascinated about this. At the same time, and I think, um, again, the education is important here. Um, how do we do this to show, I think we scientists have the um, obligation to jump a little bit out of our convenience zone to, as you said, with me, uh, social media, to, to show our faces, to show that we are just regular people, but that's what we're doing, and then the community will get more trust into that. Th those are people like you and me, and they are scientists, and it's not something mystic, something that we, we can trust. And last but not least, I, I really like the point, like, when do we find the time to this? I think we need to train the next generation, and we're already doing that. Like, a lot of times you see at conferences that PhD students, so they have to do this, like, one-minute um, elevator speech about their research. I think we should really do much, much more about that and incorporate all of this in our education for the next generation of scientists. So that's kind of spanning it all together. We have to learn to get out there, to use me social media, to be short and succinct, and to show the public that, no, we do not know everything. We're not some famous somebody, but we're still scientists. Thank you. Actually, I have to look at the organizers now because there's so much interest. Um, if we can do go a little over time, um, because um, maybe five minutes, uh, I have the minister, I have two or three more colleagues, and then a, a final round up here. Uh, thank you. Um, again, I've seen that this is such a broad area. Uh, because on the one hand we have to start uh, in, in, in school with, uh, with the young children uh, and I totally agree with you, we have to find a way uh, to reach them at their level of interest. Uh, but especially uh, concerning YouTube, I've also talked with my sons um, about this subject and what they told me was that their expectation in YouTube videos are re really high uh, and what, what uh, the schools are bringing is not at that level, not at least coming to that level. So if we want to reach young people uh, via this, uh, this media, we have to do much more, we have to improve the quality of, of, of YouTube videos. Uh, teachers just sitting at their desk in their home uh, and just, just talking about mathematic problems isn't interesting the younger people. So we have to do a lot of work there. Uh, but uh, I agree with you, it has to be done. And by the way, Ludwig Boltzmann's desk is still at the University of Graz. So whenever you come to Graz, I'm glad to show it to you. Um, uh, and also uh, looking at the children, 
um, we, we, we know that we have to do work here uh, and we started uh, a, a new school subject, digital literacy now at the fifth level uh, and starting now fifth to, to eighth level in the Mittelschule and the Unterstufe. Um, and we also know that we have to do much more concerning media literacy. Uh, because this is one, one of the main topics that, that the young people uh, learn more about the, the chances and the risks of, of social media, of digitalization. And there has to be done much more work in schools. And, and I think we, uh, we, will, we will find uh, quite good answers in, in the next years uh, concerning that. Uh, and coming uh, just, just with a few sentences to the whole topic of skepticism into science. So this is uh, why I have, uh, have ordered a study now, because we have to take a closer look which, which people in which region, regions at which age need what answers or how can we reach them, because I don't think uh, there will be just a simple, simple answer or a simple way, um, especially when you talk about the elder people. Um, there was a, in, in Alpach, I uh, had quite interesting talks uh, with experts concerning uh, scientific communication. And there was one professor from Klagenfurt. Um, she told us that there is still most people, especially elder people, uh, get most of the information via television. So we have to find a way communicating with them via the television. Uh, as you are uh, right, they are not looking zip two. It's too late for them. Uh, we have we have to find other ways at, at other times, and we have to find uh, their language. So so this is will be uh, very important, and we also have to find not only the language. We have to know what questions they have, and as, as you said, uh, people want solutions to lead a happy life. Yes. What we have to show them is that science cannot bring simple solutions. So this will be one of the most important uh, 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 projects that we have to, to bring people uh, to think about or to learn that we cannot have always simple solutions. This is very, I think, is a crucial point also for the future of our democracy uh, because people want to have simple solutions. Uh, we cannot provide them. Uh, yeah, those people who can provide them uh, cannot do this. They have made, just make the impression, but uh, especially looking at, at, at uh, elections in the next years, uh, we have to take care that we show people that the simple solutions uh, that are offered to them by some especially left or right-wing parties are not really the answers they want to have. So this, this will be a very, uh, a very, big, uh, very big task for all of us. Uh, but these are all uh, things we are discussing next week uh, in our, in our uh, starting conference in Vienna, September 27th, uh, 22nd, uh, concerning trust in science. So I all, all uh, of you also, via the internet, I all invite you uh, to join this conference uh, online. I know it will be a little bit early for you because it starts at 2 p.m. Uh, in Vienna, so this is 7 o'clock here in the morning. Um, but it will, it, it will take uh, the whole afternoon. Uh, so I hope some of you will, will join us uh, and, and give us some, some, further, um, some further advice and, and uh, help us in, in working because this is a long-time project. I know that, that uh, improving... Uh, trust in science and democracy cannot only be done uh, by one series of TV spots uh, or two or three conferences. This is a, this is a work which has to be planned uh, for a long time of years. As we've seen in Portugal, um, as someone mentioned, especially if you see this, uh, they have worked now, I think, on 15 years uh, on, this, on this subject. And, and we have also to look about 10 or 15 years. But I also invite you to join us in this great way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's not last words yet, um, but it's um, a, a wonderful summary. Um, you come after the two uh, questions or comments, because then I go back to the panel for a final round. All the way in the back, please. Okay. Hello, uh, Dennis Theoman, PhD candidate in urban planning at Virginia Tech. And I just wanted to say something briefly about the mistrust um, in science because I think the people who mistrusted, especially what we saw now, which became very prevalent in Austria during the COVID pandemic, uh, those people 
have, I think, a general mistrust in all the institutions um, of the country. So that starts from politics to journalism. And then I think science is a little bit was caught up there because um, po politics and science was kind of very close to each other um, during the COVID pandemic. So I think we are kind of hitting a ceiling as scientists in some ways because we can do a lot, especially engaging with young people, but with people who have deep mistrust in all the different institutions that make a country strong. Um, I think we'll really notice our limits very quickly and then it has to be a collective effort of all those different institutions to, to increase the... Um, to increase the, the trust of people. And uh, I think in that sense, the mistrust in science is just also a reflection of the mistrust, mistrust in other institutions. So I think science is also just suffering a little bit um, because of the mistrust that people have in, in all the other things. Thank you. Thank you. And now in the first row. First row here. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Lisa Gabler. I'm postdoc at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute, and I did my PhD in Vienna at the Medical University. I would just like to raise one more point that has been skipped so far today. I think there is, as to my information, there is a slight chance equality gap regarding kids that enter school system in Austria and eventually finish their PhD. So I guess that the percentage of kids and their parents are academic degrees are about three, three times higher as those where their parents are actually from the working class. And I do think that we are already doing very great concerning fundings and scholarships, like I made my way here by these all options, but there is one more point, and I think this is very important, especially those kids where the parents are not that high educated. They are very, very, so their confidence is not very high, and they very often don't think that they are actually able to do this. And I think what we need to do in school is to engage them to really, that they are able to do this, that they have the power, and. They also have all the different funding options in Austria, and I think this is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Now we come to the final round um, on the panel, and I would like to start with Petra. Thank you, yeah. Um, maybe following up with what you just said, uh, I think a lot of people think that they are actually able to do it better. And that's a big problem that we are facing when we talk about trust issues. Um, but I wanted to circle back to a couple of things that were said earlier in the audience. Um, one gentleman over there mentioned the science behind the science, which I think is very interesting. Um, because I feel like we as scientists, we just love to talk about our methodologies and not everyone is really interested in that. So maybe that's, that's one thing when we talk about the science of science or the science behind the science, maybe we should just focus more on why should people care. Um, and the other thing um, that was mentioned somewhere around here, I think, uh, about not just talking about the rock stars in science and the Nobel uh, Prize uh, recipients, but really also talking about the everyday science, uh, scientists around us. Um, but also I think the mistakes that happen in science because there's a lot of stuff happening in these laboratories that no one knows about and sharing that would maybe also bring it down to earth a little more and make it more accessible, make it more human because we all make mistakes as humans. And um, I always wanted to be a rock star in a band, but I never got there because it felt so much pressure when like, looking at bands like U2 or the Rolling Stones or whatever. Well, I guess people feel the same pressure when they look at the Nobel Prize uh, recipients and other scientist rock stars. So if we share more the what's really going on there and how many mistakes are actually happening until we get to a new innovation, um, maybe that brings it closer to the people as well. 
Yeah, I'd like to second what uh, the last commenter said about, you know, tearing down some barriers and being conscious that these barriers have consequences that last probably an entire career, an entire lifetime. And we need to continue supporting, uh, you know, scientists from underrepresented groups, provide them with role models, etc. Um, but also, you know, what gets, what gets people interested in science in the first place? I, I would like to come back to the journalism task and the, and the division of labor because, you know, maybe there is a role for this kind of science journalism that you described. But when we think about getting people interested in science, getting people engaged with science, that requires a different kind of communication, engagement, and, and journalism, frankly. There are different norms that guide that kind of journalism, such as newsworthiness, such as participation or opportunity for, for, you know, for everybody. And, and if, we, if we reorient um, the, the way we engage with, uh, with the public, be that through museums or you know, outreach buses or whatever you know, there, there might be, that's a different, that's a different approach than um, explaining very technical detail uh, in, a, in a slightly more understandable way that still remains in a bubble. Thank you. Peter, last but not least. Thank you. Um, so I want to tell you, um, last but not least, a, a, a story that um, sort of my own, my own experience. About a year ago, we had a big finding, and um, it, was, it was one of those that, that a lot of people could understand. So um, it, it piqued the interest of the Conan Zeitung. Um, and so you may laugh at this, but it was, it was, the process was very interesting. Um, and it showed me that if you want to reach the wider public in Austria, you need to basically communicate through the Conan Zeitung. Um, now, not only, so if you want to know how to communicate science um, to the Austrian public, my suggestion to, you know, the Ministerium, Mysterium, Universitäten um, is meet with a group, have a, a partnership with the Conan Zeitung. And first start with a fact-finding mission, just understand what, because I can guarantee you one thing, the Conan Zeitung editors, the um, Redakteure, have a fantastic understanding what, what, they, what the readership likes and what they don't like. They know exactly, they have the finger on the pulse. So you should meet with them go to them and meet with them and ask them, how can we, can we communicate better? This is out of the bubble. So meet with the Conan Zeitung and you will get, you will get answers that you may not like, uh, but you will get the answers to communicate this. Um, and so if you get a strategic partnership with them, again, by, for instance, highlighting people and not just you know, projects, you may, may have a, a way into the wider public. Thank you so much. Um, I think um, there was a lot of food for thought, um, and there will be other food as well very soon. Um, but I, I think you can have further discussions um, during the lunch break, and, and later in the afternoon we will have another panel um, where we can um, see some <coughs> examples from the U.S. Um, but I think um, all those um, actors... Um, in Austria and in the US will take back quite some messages um, for the future work um, regarding transparency of processes, um, media literacy, accountability, uh, make, finding the right language, making things visual, um, and also finding incentives and time for the researchers to actually get engaged. So it's about career systems, it's about recruitment, um, it's about um, incentives um, in various ways. Uh, so with that, I think um, we give back the floor to our moderator um, so that um, we get instructions because we um, also need to work during lunch. It's not just lunch, it's networking lunch and it's um, <laughs> presentations. Um, so thank you to the panel. Um, thank you so much for your engagement and your future engagement. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Maybe you just want to stay seated. I'm just going to do like quick remarks and then we can all go to lunch. I don't want to keep you for too long. I agree with everything that you said. Just one point, one addition. You can also reach out to the ORF. We can also reach a lot of people. <laughs> I kind of have to do that, you know. Um, 
There will be another panel coming up, so thank you very much for all of you. If you have more questions, I have some questions. I'm just going to keep them for like in an hour for our next panel. Great panelists up there as well. One last thing before lunch, we will screen our uh, top 10 uh, posters from this year's ARID uh, poster session, 90-second pitches of their presentations. Lunch starts now. Please be back at 2 p.m. sharp, and uh, we'll continue our discussions. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Ulrike Dudak, Professor at the School of Health Sciences at Purdue University. This poster is on my group's work on elucidating the health risks of exposure to the metal manganese in welders. In our previous work, we have used MRI to visualize the distribution and dynamics of excess manganese in the human brain. Furthermore, using advanced MR spectroscopy techniques, we found significant increases of the neurotransmitter GABA in highly exposed welders. With today's lower exposure, it is assumed that changes in mood, such as depression and anxiety, are amongst the first symptoms to appear. Therefore, the goal of the study was to assess whether manganese exposure in welders is associated with mood changes and whether these changes are reflected in neuroimaging. We studied a cohort of 40 male welders and compared them to a well-matched group of non-exposed shift workers from the same factory. Personal air sampling was used to assess exposure, a brief symptom inventory to assess nine categories of mood, an MRI and MRS to measure manganese deposition in the brain and GABA changes in the thalamus. We found a shockingly high percentage of our welders and of controls showing clinically significant mood symptoms. If you're interested in finding out which of the mood categories correlated with manganese exposure in welders or with salamic GABA levels, or whether mood symptoms are reversible with decreasing exposure over three years, then please take a closer look at our poster. Thank you for your attention. Welcome everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present our research on causal study design at the 2022 Austin Research and Innovation Talk. My name is Michael Grabner and I work as a principal scientist at HealthCore, where we conduct health services research on behalf of life science companies and our parent company, Elements Health. Many of my colleagues contributed to this work and I would like to acknowledge them. The gold standard for assessing whether a medical treatment works is the randomized controlled trial. Increasingly, observational, non-experimental data are available for research, and these too can be used to investigate causal effects. Existing methodological literature on this topic is rich, but can be complex and daunting to navigate. Therefore, our team created a visually appealing, user-friendly step-by-step guide that describes key conceptual issues of importance in designing causal inference studies with observational healthcare data. These steps help elucidate what estimate is being targeted, how to systematically identify and address common design biases, and asks researchers to conduct robust sensitivity analysis. There are limitations to our guide as listed here. Thank you for your time and we appreciate your consideration. New technologies have changed how we think, live and learn, yet they also challenge our democracies. Thus in education we make use of progressive methods to enhance learning, 
One of these methods is game-based learning, which utilizes elements of play to create immersive learning experiences. But new methods alone are not the solution to tackle the state of learning today. To enable effective learning, we need to rethink what skills we require to secure individual growth and democratic behavior. Moral competence may be one of these skills. Moral competence is the ability to translate moral intuition into action and the cornerstone of democratic behavior. My research combined game-based learning methods with the psychology of moral competence to create morally, an immersive learning experience to engage students in democratic thinking. Based on an experiment conducted at Teachers College at Columbia University with the help of the Marshall Plan Foundation, Morally has demonstrated to be a promising approach in creating a game-based learning experience with the potential to strengthen moral competence. Follow-up studies are needed to secure the findings, but I am convinced that game-based learning can contribute to foster values that we require to sustain our democracies. Thank you very much. Hi everybody, my name is Denise Haslwanter and I'm happy to present to you today my work, which was on the yellow heel vaccine, showing reduced neutralization titers against South American strains, which was published in Cell Host and Microbe this year. Yellow heel virus causes up to 30,000 deaths worldwide and remains a major public health threat despite an excellent vaccine available. The vaccine is based on an African strain and is applied worldwide. This makes sense since 90% of the yellow fever cases occur in Africa. However, yellow fever virus also spreads in South America, causing regular outbreaks with hundreds of deaths only recently. Therefore, a major World Health Organization goal is to eliminate yellow fever virus worldwide. In my work, I show that the vaccine produces 90% less neutralization titers against South American virus strains compared to the African ones, and I was able to map this reduced neutralization to two locations on a major virus surface protein E. Although it was known that South American strains are genetically different, this was so far overlooked since worldwide only African virus strains are used for diagnostics and mostly for research. I hope my study will be a roadmap for the future of yellow fever virus vaccine design. Hi, my name is Esther and I'm excited to talk to you about building better machine learning models for chemical reactions. And although machine learning is really successful for predicting molecules, the prediction of reactions is lagging behind, mainly due to limitations in available architectures and data preparations. And we show how principles from cheminformatics, like the condensed graph of reaction or how the diagrams can be utilized to first develop new reaction representations for message passing neural networks, achieving set of the art performances for properties like activation energies. And then second, to improve photosynthesis models, predicting a synthesis pathway to what a specified chemical, which is a classification problem. However, classification requires mutually exclusive classes, which reaction templates are not. So we developed a method based on Hasse diagrams to enforce exclusivity and could beat set of the art approaches. And then third, we could also use CTRs and Hasse diagrams to predict the subset ranges of enzymes, taking into account their promiscuity, and we're able to predict enzymatic assay results. So summing up, inclusion of principles from chem informatics into machine learning has helped us to build new, highly accurate models for chemical reaction properties, as well as organic and biocatalytic synthesis planning. And our results were already used in several independent projects. For more information, I really hope to see you at my poster. Thanks. Bye. Welcome to the presentation of our paper, JEDI, these aren't the JSON documents you're looking for, where we deal with JSON similarity queries. Let's consider we would like to build a movie database. 
Instead of inserting the movies by hand, a crawler is used to collect movies in the internet from various sources, typically stored in JSON format. To avoid redundancy and hence save valuable storage capacities, we first check whether a movie already exists in the database. However, an exact matching of movies is not effective, since they might have a different structure. Therefore, data items should be matched by similarity, which allows to tolerate minor differences. Unfortunately, no suitable similarity function for JSON documents is known. To this end, we introduced the first JSON added distance, or short JEDI, which computes the similarity based on a novel tree representation of documents. It is defined as the minimum number of node edit operations that transform one tree into the other. To efficiently compute JSON similarity queries, we present three techniques. The first, JSON similarity index, which only returns documents that are likely to be in the result, called candidates an upper bound filter that effectively verifies candidates without computing the real distance, and an efficient JEDI algorithm. An experimental evaluation on 22 real-world datasets suggests that our solution scales to databases with millions of large documents. Compliant with the open science movement, our publication and reproducible experiments are publicly available. Thank you. My name is Martin Riedel, and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for Media Engagement at the University of Texas at Austin. In the summer before the 2016 US presidential election, two Facebook sites, Heart of Texas and the United Muslims of America, published event pages advertising protests in front of a mosque and religious center in downtown Houston. Later, it was revealed that both pages had been created by the Russian Internet Research Agency. Our study unpacks these protests and their local context to illuminate how foreign government interference in social media may instigate conflict and can exacerbate existing politi political divides. We traced Facebook event ads back to the people who attended these protests and conducted in-depth interviews with them. First, our study highlights how the ways in which activists and organizers use social media can easily be co-opted by nefarious actors that prey on dynamics associated with social movements. Second, the protests must be understood in the broader context of white supremacy. In Houston, the IRA harnessed anti-Muslim sentiment, racism, and xenophobia, homegrown problems of the United States. Third, the apparent target, the Houston Mosque and Religious Center, never got involved in the actual counter-protest, pinpointing differing strategies of managing hatred. Our study provides insights into some of the specifics of IRA-initiated events. This can be particularly useful for understanding contemporary Russian propaganda efforts. Hi, I am Pavla Schuster, a PhD student in economics at the New School for Social Research. My current research investigates what happens to couples if one partner retires. Will the other partner follow into retirement as well? This is particularly interesting if we look at retirements during the COVID-19 pandemic. Most of the retirements during this period were involuntary, following unemployment and can be seen as an unexpected shock to the retirement decision. I analyze how this individual shock of one partner also affects the retirement decision of the other partner. I use monthly panel data from the U.S. Current Population Survey from 2013 to 2021, which allows me to capture potential job loss and new retirements. And I perform an OLS regression to estimate the effects of an individual's own, but also the partner's employment status on the individual's retirement decision. Before the pandemic, I find that a retired partner increased the likelihood for retirement, irrespective of gender. This indicates a preference for joint and planned retirement among couples. However, the pandemic changed this pattern. Involuntary retirement caused by the pandemic acts as an unexpected shock from the partner's employment status that now decreases one's own likelihood to retire. This particularly applies to women ages 60 to 65. Before the pandemic, women with a retired partner were more likely to retire as well. However, they are now significantly less likely to retire, even if their partner has already retired. Reading literature can shape, change, or help the way we understand our lives and the world around us. 
Even more so when the literary texts we read contain elements that we can relate to. With food being a part of all our lives, it can make a fictional situation relatable through its proximity and its familiarity. The U.S. Austrian author Lore Sega's experiences throughout her life course are crucially entangled with the foods her fictional characters are surrounded by. I have researched the meaning of food in selected works by Sega, who has chosen literary fiction as a means to write her life story. The fictionalization of her life course allows us as readers to receive a broad diversity of representations of her own experiences with growing up and growing older. Food is a crucial element for the relationships in her texts, but it also helps us understand her aging process between families, countries, and cultures, and allows us to understand aging and old age as multifaceted and situationally dependent rather than one-dimensional and stagnant. Hi, my name is Martin Wilkovich and I'm currently a postdoc at TU Wien. During my Marshall Plan Scholarship at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School, I focused on controlling the functions of biomolecules within the native surroundings by bioorthogonal turnoff. We were first in developing the SAFE method to remove fluorescent signals from alive cells and tissues. Antibody dye conjugates are allowed to accumulate on their specific cellular targets and are visualized by fluorescence microscopy. Afterwards, a chemical scissors is administered, turning off the fluorescent signal by biorthogonal bond cleavage. This step can be repeated multiple times to probe the entire immunocyte population present on the target cells. We show that SAFE is capable of erasing fluorescent signals from live antibody labeled cells ultra fast within seconds critically performing at non-toxic concentrations. Moreover, SAFE is durable for long time frames beyond 24 hours, showing no signal rebound while keeping the native cells alive. With our technology, we could generate multiplex profiles of live marine hepatic tissue, identifying a single T cell expressing certain targets. In the future, the SAFE technique will enable the profiling of cancer cells to investigate how the Marcus population will affect its response to therapy. I invite you to take a look at my poster and our publication in Nature Biotech. Thank you. To everyone, I hope everybody is well fed and energized for the second part of our day. A, I was told just a brief point of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, if you need to leave the room, um, some of you might have realized that the door's uh, a little noisy, so please take the door here to the right, uh, if I look back, next to the technicians, and just make sure to, like, carefully close it. Somebody will be there, like, so that we don't get interrupted by a loud, too loud bangs um, during our talks. Uh, next up is our next uh, panel discussion. We're talking about bridging the gap, um, how to communicate, how to um, speak to the public. Um, we have representatives from like two major uh, Chicago area universities here, University of Chicago and Northwestern. And without further ado, I want to ask my panelists to join me. Uh, first up from the Science and Communications program at the University of Chicago, Chicago Peggy Mason. Uh, she's Professor of Neurobiology at the Univers University of Chicago. Welcome. <clears throat> then uh, Sarah Saritella, Director of Communications of the Institute for Translational Medicine and Lecturer at the University of Chicago. Welcome. <clears throat> then from Northwestern, uh, Kiki Zisimopoulos, I hope that was kind of correct. <laughs> Assistant Professor of Instruction, McCormick School of Engineering at North Northwestern. <laughs> and Beth Bennett, Associated Dean and Professor of Journalism at Medal School of Journalism, Media, Integrated Marketing and Communications. Welcome. So I'd like to start out with the University of Chicago. If you could go ahead and give a, give a brief introduction of your program, what you're doing, what you're working on. 
Happy to. Thank you so much. So at the University of Chicago, we have built the first four-credit science communications program for scientists. So yes, there are programs out there that teach communications, but we focus specifically for scientists, those going into medicine, researchers. And we have built a program that revolves around knowing and engaging your audience so that then you can have the opportunity to inform and inspire people to change the world. We've done that with a robust undergraduate program. We've had wait lists for every course that we've put together uh, under this model and where people actually get, our students get real world experience, both the theory and the practice for writing and applying these skills, which we look forward to diving into in just a moment. But first, we wanted to take you behind the scenes to see a quick little video to show how we work to make our students comfortable because you can only learn when you are comfortable enough to get outside and at the edge of your comfort zone. And before we play that video, anything else you wanted to add, Peggy? <laughs> All right. Take it away. Behind the scenes. Drum roll. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Now it should be fine. Oh. Well, while, of course, Science technical are elements kidding. are a natural part of any <laughs> conference and convention, we'll give them a few minutes for pulling that video up. But as you can see from here, I'll give you a little preface. We do drills. In this course, they're learning how to give a dynamic talk to a public audience, which also applies for research, right? Who here has been into a room where there's been a snooze fest going on? Boring slides, yeah, monotone, yeah. Okay, so we help get rid of those things and give them the skills and the storytelling abilities to really bring that into the real world. And one of the drills that has been a favorite among our students is what you'll see in this dinosaurs, dinosaurs are, are bananas. Eating bananas. Dinosaurs, dinosaurs are eating bananas. Dinosaurs are eating bananas. Dinosaurs are eating bananas. Dinosaurs are eating bananas. Final filming day. Where they give their talks. Get out of their so shell. Of the skills that I learned from science communications and learning how to structure a really sticky, attention grabbing, interesting story. And I got an A on my thesis, and I'm graduating with honors. So that's within the school. The dinosaurs are eating banana, it's a mad lib. Okay, 90% of communication is nonverbal, right? So they pick words and then for a minute solid need to deliver that same sentence in as many different ways as possible. So they learn and have to get uncomfortable with coming up with different combinations and tell a story with a sentence that makes no sense, but to try to communicate that through their vocal delivery and body language to their audience. So that's in there and you saw how a student was actually able to apply it to get an award for her thesis in the building, but our students also know that they use this to apply and change the world outside. Play the video over to you, part two. Here's a comment from a student about the importance as a scientist learning this. And it should hopefully come up any moment any now. Any moment now, right? <laughs> yeah. Research is just relegated to the scientific world, that it just gets stuck in there. And it doesn't go to the people who need it. And so that's why it's really important that like, science communication breaks everything down. She was an alum of our program, and our students have gone on to already apply those skills in building websites, telling stories, putting together videos from organ transplant teams and how they actually fly across the country and bring life-saving organs to people. All these things on their own. So we're really proud of what they've done and are excited for this next generation. And over to you, Peggy, for other additions and favorite parts of the course that we put together so far. Yeah, I... It, it's just so heartening to see what the students do. They learn that the communication is essentially a performance. Um, when they're doing a video communication, they have to be performers, and they have to put themselves out, and they have to show their enthusiasm in order for anyone else to be interested. Um, when we're talking about writing, it's the same thing. It's, it's teaching these young people that what interests them may not be what interests the person on the street. 
and they've really got to make it applicable. I can say that the, re the way I got into talking to the public was when a piece of my research went, I, I wouldn't call it viral, I would call it sort of semi-bacterial or something. <laughs> and I talked to a lot of people and, and I really enjoyed it. And then the university asked me to make a massively open online course, which I was very happy to do. And when I was organizing that, I didn't have an audience. So I had to invent an audience. And it really wasn't going that spectacularly well for about three weeks. And then my producer says to me, you've got to have some picture of who you're talking to. And that afternoon on the train, that I, my commuter train, my conductor told me he had signed up for the course. And I thought, oh my God, <laughs> I have got to make this interesting because I know how hard he works. He works all day long on the train. You don't know the Metro. Metro is a tough job. It's a really tough job. And, and at the end of the day, he goes home. He cooks meal. I, I knew his wife was sick. I knew that he had a lot of things on his mind. And if I don't grab his attention and have a really good reason for him to listen to me, he's not going to listen to me, and even though he's interested. He wouldn't have signed up if he wasn't interested. So I have this picture of a person who has w worked all day long, has just fed the kids, is doing the dishes, and has an iPad right there, and wants to learn something, but I have to meet them. And that's what we, that's what we teach these students. You know, why is that interesting? Why is that interesting? Not to you, to, to everyone. Why is that human interest? And it's all about human interest. There's a human core to every science element and story and conflict and emotion. And we teach people to be detectives. Dig it up, find it, so that you can share it with the world so it <coughs> sticks. Thank you so much. It's uh, very inspiring. I, I think we have a lot of questions about that. And um, I would hand it over to Northwestern, if you could talk briefly about your program. Can I have the slide up, please, for this? Thank you. Insert so, Jeopardy music here. Yes, exactly. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. It's going to come up. Okay, great. Perfect. There we go. So I want to just briefly introduce you to the offerings at Northwestern. One thing I do want to highlight is that the courses you just heard about at UChicago are for undergraduates. Um, and then these courses, I just want to point out, are, are actually for our graduate students. And I have two offerings that I want to briefly discuss. So on your left, you see the Research Communication Training Program. This is in, we just celebrated our 10th anniversary. Uh, it's the 10th year of offering this program. And it is an interactive and team-taught in-person course. We also start with improv. And our first instructor actually has a theater background. So he has a theater and improv background. And the purpose of that is just to get the students out of their shells. Um, it is often very terrifying for them. So we want to just break the ice and get them into this sort of, let me try things. They may or may not work. So we start off with that module. Our second module is actually taught by Beth Bennett, who we have here today from the journalism school. And in this module, Beth discusses storytelling, jargon. So we start to get into the content of their talk now that they're, they're all warmed up. And then she also throws them a little bit in the deep end. And the picture you see here is a student from this summer um, at our studio at Medill. And Beth has them do interviews. So what they might experience um, you know, with a, um, a journalist. And we film and give them feedback. And so again, a lot of just getting them to actually do things and practice. And then the um, instructors after that, one discusses graphic design to help the students put together their slides. And then we do some workshopping and also quite a bit of peer feedback. Um, one thing I heard from students is that that's actually one of the most important aspects of the course is just getting feedback in different perspectives. These students come from all different disciplines, and so they get feedback that they would not normally get in their lab. So that's the um, RCTP course, and the QR code will take you to our website where you can see some example videos that our students have completed. Um, the last thing I'll say about this course is that the students have two choices. 
They can either do a live symposium, we call it seven minutes of scholarship, and so they get up and, and present their, their seven-minute talk, or they can choose to self-produce with the help of a, an expert, um, a video, a th shorter two- to three-minute video that they can also use for um, their LinkedIn or their website. So they do have that option. On the right is an NSF-funded program, recognizing that not all students are fortunate enough to have access to these in-person opportunities. We developed from the basis of RCTP, what we call SCOPE, the Science Communication Online Program. And this is an online asynchronous program. And the screenshot here is what a student might see. So they'll watch a video and do some exercises. And then here we have students from all over. And again, that QR code will take you to the website. You'll see that our participants have come from all over the world um, with this program. So these two uh, in parallel are, are Northwestern's um, graduate level offerings. Anything I missed? I think you got it all. Okay, okay thank you so much. Um, this morning, we had some discussions between um, scientists here in the room about like, how to go about communicating what they do. Some were like, we should go out there, do more, put content out like on social media, reach out ourselves. Others were saying, I'm a scientist, so I, want, like, I have my network of like, science journalists, but I, like, I want them to do the job. I want them then to like, break it down to an audience so that they can understand it. One way or another, why is it important for scientists to be, to be good, efficient communicators? Whoever wants. Maybe Beth, as you haven't. Yeah, I'd be happy to take that. First of all, I love this idea, like, do I do it myself? Or do I develop a relationship with a really good journalist who I really trust? And I actually think both approaches are great approaches as a journalist and someone who... Um, is at the Medill School of Journalism, we teach uh, journalists to understand, interpret, um, to have knowledge of research and science so they can be good storytellers and interpreters. And so I think that's a really important um, thing to honor. But I also think we see more and more scientists being able to take their own work and um, put it out for public consumption and hopefully get um, non-peers, non-scientists interested in their work. Um, and so I think both sort of strategies work. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's sort of knowing yourself, right? Which, which um, where are you most, most comfortable? I do think developing storytelling skills is sort of a muscle. And so if it's something, if you're sort of more like, oh, I prefer to give it to a journalist I trust, which is great. But I do think there are aspects of storytelling and communication that can easily be developed and worked on over time. So I tell students it's sort of like a yoga practice, like you're never done, you're never there. You're always kind of building on it um, over time incrementally. And maybe you'll be good at one piece of it and maybe another piece not so much. And so you kind of focus there or slowly try to add to your skill set. Completely agree. The two-pronged approach is so important for a few reasons. Number one, those storytelling skills, whether you are talking to a journalist or you are trying to get more funding for your research or get some donors from your university involved, you need to be able to tell your story. You need to get people to care. And being able to have that skill set to quickly get people to think and feel Science shows, as we know, that when people feel really strong emotion, positive or negative, they're more likely to act. So when you use those elements, it will help your career, whether or not you're going to talk to a journalist. If you are going to talk to a journalist, as a former journalist myself, I'm going to Google you. If I'm putting together a video package, I want to know if you are going to be able to speak clearly on air and in a video. Because if we have a 10-minute conversation and you're using a ton of jargon and I can't pull out that little quote, that sound bite that I need, I'm going to need to try to find somebody else. Because there's a 24-hour news cycle. Everyone is really tight on time. If you can make the reporter's life easy, then you will be their go-to source. And it actually helps you build that relationship with those science journalists. The other cool thing is that now more than ever online, you have access to a free world where you can put up a website. You can have a TikTok or a YouTube channel. There are some people with more followers on their TikTok and YouTube than subscribe or follow to major media outlets. Think about that. 
the New York Times, CNN. You can build your own platform and be able to put more context there. So if you have a two-pronged approach, yes, build relationships with science journalists, get your work out there, but also own your own story as a researcher and share the work that you're doing so you don't have to wait for that call. And if someone isn't interested in the story, that's okay. You can put it out there, and then maybe that will actually be the thing that garnishes that interest and has another reporter reach out to you. I'll just add one thing, which is I, I, I do both, and I actually love talking to journalists. I find in most instances that um, they're so skilled. They're so good at what they do, and they take me out of my, uh, I, you know, I can weed out like or nerd out like the rest of the scientists. So talking to a journalist, they can, they can take uh, flights of fancy that are a little bit more difficult for me. And so there really is a role for them. The other thing that I would add is, as somebody earlier today said, um, why should we communicate to the public? Well, the public pays us. We work for them. They're, they're, my, they're my employer. That is how science works. I, I don't think this is optional. I think this is absolute, I mean, I think it's the only ethical thing to do. So how would you say that your students benefit from those programs? Also, like, what I think, like, if as a scientist already while you're in school, you learn how to commu communicate, maybe the barrier then is lower to go and communicate because you're not like, okay, I'm a scientist, but I'm not an expert in uh, communication. Would you say that's one of the benefits that comes from your programs? Maybe Yeah, for sure. I, I also, so I can share some things that students have told me about the benefits of the program. Um, one actually came from, so I was previously at the University of Chicago, one of our students raised her hand in the middle of the course and said, I never thought I'd learn so much science in a communication course. <laughs> It's like, yeah, exactly, right? Our students were talking about all different disciplines, all different areas, and in the process of figuring out how, to, how they could best communicate it, they were also teaching their peers. So we very much, or I should say, I very much view communication as a form of teaching. So they also learn science. And then another thing that the students benefit from, I mentioned earlier, are just the different perspectives. Um, especially at the grad level, you're in your lab and you're surrounded by people who think the same way as you do about your field. And then when you're suddenly asked to explain it to a historian or to someone you know, from the English department or to a journalist, um, it, it makes them realize, oh, maybe I either don't fully understand this or I need new terms, I need new words and ways of describing it. So that other perspective they really value. I would also add that I think it helps them explain what they do to their families. So some of our students have a hard time explaining their work to the people in their life. And so I think there's a benefits beyond sort of public communication. And also I tend to think it um, helps students to enjoy story more. Um, so students will say to me, we teach narrative structure, so we teach sort of the structure of how stories happen and how we feel emotion as a story unfolds. And so students will say to me, I, I can't watch Game of Thrones anymore without picking it apart or without like, you know, going to a movie and like really just sitting there and thinking all about the structure. And I think that's, that's great. Like it, it, it creates, I think, more sort of um, joy in storytelling in sort of all aspects of life. I think one thing from this morning is also that there's a broad interest, general interest in science, but that for some reasons, like multiple reasons, neither scientists nor we journalists, to some extent, know how to reach those people, how to connect with them. And uh, I want to circle back to you, Peggy, uh, what you said about your conductor and that you need to get like that human touch, that human interest. So how do you teach or which advices do you give your students to like, number one, know who they want to reach and like how they want to reach those people? You, you just have to take yourself out of the I got trained as a scientist and put yourself into the I'm a human being category. So I, I'll give you an example. I, I also wrote a textbook, and, in it, and the textbook is on neurobiology, and there's a lot of textbooks on neurobiology, but this is for medical students. And if you look at a textbook on, on neurobiology, all the others, 
they'll talk to you about, when they're talking to you about locomotion, they'll talk to you about leeches and how leeches swim. And they might get up to how a cat walks, ish. But really, they're talking about leeches. Well, these medical students have a lot to learn. They do not have time for leeches. And we are not leeches. And there's actually a lot of science about how we walk. So even though the, the... you know, the zeitgeist is that I should teach them about leeches. I didn't do that. I just decided I didn't teach them about walking. And what is walking? You know, gait plus balance. Okay, that alone tells you a lot. Gait plus balance. Um, and so I, I think you just have to say, you have to be willing to say, I am a nerd and I love this. This is super, super interesting to me and it is not important or relevant to this person. I just can't, I can't make the argument that it, it needs five minutes of their time. So that's what you really need to do. Remember, remember who you are. Talk to your mom. Talk to your dad. Talk to your brother. My brothers are, are okay, if, if, I have, if I talk to my mom, she's the most scientific one in my family. But if I talk to my brothers, they could care less. So if I can convince them that something's interesting, then we're good to go. Um, yeah, talk to the people in your life. Share, share your passion, also like transfer like that emotion that you have for... So. I mean, that's the other thing. Content, is, unfortunately, and this is sort of a sad fact, um, enthusiasm counts for so much more than content. I, I, anyone who teaches knows that. Um, there's a bad side to that, actually. I was on a science communication panel this morning where somebody brought up the fact that the people who are, for example, anti-vaxxers are extremely charismatic and extremely enthusiastic. So that, that fact that enthusiasm counts more than content is, is a neutral fact. It can be used for good and it can be used for bad. We, we, we need to use it for good. And one of the things we specifically do in, in class with our frameworks is we ask our students why over and over again. Why should anyone care? Listen, well, my science, of course everyone should, but why? Why should that person across the street care? Why should anybody care? And what, to the passion point, gets you so excited that you want to get out of bed every morning and do this? When you're in science, right, you dedicate your life to studying something for the hopes that it moves on and does something to change the world. So why the heck do you care? Why did you get into it? And when you start to feel that, that energy is contagious. And we've had some pretty interesting answers from our students with that and we keep going back okay why you got to push you got to push really get people to dig into that core Mm. communicating science in general can be quite challenging because you are talking about very complex matters and i would say in the last couple of years there was an added challenge which we have seen during the covid pandemic did we kind of live in a post-factual world where some parts of the population cannot agree with the other part that the sky is blue. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but like you talked about vaccines, we talked about like COVID, that people say COVID, it's a hoax, it's nothing. So how can we, or how do you teach your your students to address those people who to some degree might be lost to, to us, to facts, to science? Difficult question, I know. That's a very di- that's a good question though. That's it, but it's a very difficult question. Um, I don't know that we talk specifically about disinformation unless it happens in other areas. I do think we we talk about sort of having a sense of authority, and um, students struggle with this because being enthusiastic and um, be- being performative sometimes doesn't feel like you're also presenting a sense of authority. And that's a struggle that students kind of bring to us, which is I want to be fun or funny or interesting or have enthusiasm, but then won't that undercut my authority as a researcher? Will people really believe me if I'm acting silly or if I'm acting in a way that doesn't seem becoming of a scholar? And I think that's a real struggle, especially for students who are um, you know, PhD candidates and just kind of trying to come into their own in the field. Um, and so, of course, you know, I'm like, go ahead and be silly. It'll be fine, you know. <laughs> and I, and, but I get their legitimate concern over it. 
Um, interestingly, I think it's important that they own sort of their authentic selves and are able to be comfortable doing that and still feel a sense of authority. And we tell them all the time, we're like, you're getting a PhD from Northwestern University. You're studying with one of the premier scholars in this area. Like, why would you worry about this sense of authority? But they, but they do. So, so I, that doesn't directly answer your question, but, um, but I think it gets at it a little bit, which is why would people believe you versus someone else? Yeah, and, I'll just, and we also tell our students that um, in many fields there are misconceptions and that they should be aware of those. So again, it's you know, go out, talk to people, find out what these misconceptions are so that you can come in prepared knowing what you're up against. You know, don't go in blind assuming that people are just going to follow you along on, on your path and the story that you're telling. Mm-hmm. We've actually built a course on how to tackle misinformation and battle it. And one of the things that we teach is harnessing the power of storytelling as a tool. Because stories are universal. And if you look at the people spreading misinformation, you note that they are often telling a story for evil, getting that emotion across, not necessarily with facts. But as scientists, we have the beauty of having the facts on our side. And so if you can know your audience enough to find a story that matters to them, and weave it in. The story acts as a Trojan horse in transmitting the right information and helping to address that misinformation to really help change that Mm -hmm. tide. Now, within your institutions, how difficult, challenging is it to convince students to say, like, I'm studying physics and I want to focus on that. I don't want to, like, bother with communication. How difficult is it to, like, uh, explain it to them and convince them that that's also an important part of their education, maybe? Not, not difficult. No. So we have, we have a waiting list. And it's, yeah. what's funny is that our students, they'll be working on their projects, and their roommates will say, oh, God, I wish we had this for social sciences or for humanities. Because in reality, what we teach them, I, I, we're applying it to science. It doesn't have to be applied to science. It's, it's how you talk to people. Um, and, and I really dislike the idea that one has to dumb down. You do not. A hundred percent, I take exception to that. What you need to do is to be very, you have to know your stuff enough to say it simply and clearly. Um, and truth, so I go for clear, accessible, and true. I try to tell no lies. That's difficult. But if you tell no lies, then what's simple and clear is actually also interesting to people who know a little bit more. It's both accessible and it takes the people who know something a little bit farther. Mm. Your students are, uh, are of course, on the younger side. Is there also like maybe with like older peers a certain misconception, like I'm exaggerating exaggerating now, but saying like, I don't want to dance my research on TikTok. Like, Mm -hmm. is that something that you have to... Like, deal with sometimes? Great question. And you do not have to dance your research on TikTok. <laughs> there are other ways. Um, we do actually, we, we, a couple of things. One, we've launched a master's program that's going to be starting in 2024. So if anybody's interested, check it out. The master's in biological sciences. There's a science comms track where you can take the courses that we're talking about. Um, but within that... Undergrads, grad students, they really see the value here. We have junior faculty who we provide training for through at the Institute for Translational Medicine on how to talk on camera. Senior faculty have taken a little bit more time to come around. When they've started seeing the impacts of science comms and how their peers, who may be younger, are appearing in the news and who are getting acknowledgments for their research, then we started having people come to us and say, hey, can we get your advice on this? Hey, actually, I want to understand how to do Y or Z. And to Beth's point about being able to share what they're doing for the first time, we've actually had folks who've been in their fields for like 50 years work with us and then say, oh my gosh, for the first time, my wife and kids understand what I'm doing with my life. And that was everything for them. Like, it didn't matter the media. They're like, my family understands what I've done with my whole life now. So I think the tide has shifted. It's been a culture shift over the last maybe five to seven years. Uh, But we're getting there where it's starting to really take off. Is it also important to teach to your students to also openly communicate what we don't know. I'm like now speaking to you as like communicational experts, because if we think back at the pandemic, their messaging shifted a lot between like, 
we have to get vaccinated to stop the spread. Then he was like, no, we have to get vaccinated to like mitigate the diseases, like or also on masks. So is that something that you teach them also maybe as lessons from the pandemic when all of us like journalists, scientists, politicians were kind of like flying blind for a certain time? And so, of course, messaging changed because also research changed. Is that something that you teach them that we also need to be maybe more open about what we don't know? Yeah, I'll add that one of the tactics some of our students use in telling their story, some of them struggle. Like, I don't know how to make this relevant for my audience. My research is so niche that I'm having a hard time thinking of a way of beginning my talk that will be interesting to people. And one strategy we suggest is to tell them, like, tell the story and then say, and here's what we don't know. And this is what I'm trying to figure out. So tap into that curiosity and be upfront about this is what science still hasn't figured out. And what's so exciting is that this is what I'm working on. I'm working on like, you know, cracking this one little part of it. Um, and that, that curiosity piece can be a really effective tool. We also draw from um, media training techniques because we're not just... Um, teaching sort of how to tell sort of a discrete story where you're the only storyteller, but also how to tell story through interview. Because a lot of what um, scientists do to communicate their research is talk with journalists. And that's basically storytelling through conversation. And so part of what we teach are um, tactics that are often used in media training. And we even look at combative interview situations where, not that this would happen to anybody here, but where a journalist is really, really questioning someone in an uncomfortable way. And we sort of practice how to say, you know, that's not my area of research. That's outside of the scope of my research. But here's what, what I can tell you, or here's where my research is. And I, I tell students that they're sort of like, it's totally fine to say, I don't know, or that's outside of the scope of my research, unless you should know, because sometimes you probably should know the answer and you don't. And that's a different tactic. That's a little bit, that requires a little more finesse. Um, but I think it's important for students or for, um, for students who do our program to come out knowing that they should not ever feel forced to say anything that they hold the power to determine what they're going to say and what they're not going to say, and that they can draw the lines around their expertise. Such a good point. And with the, the pandemic is a wonderful case study of how science comms can go very wrong. I do not think that a well enough job was done to educate the public on the fact that science is always changing. From day one, when this pandemic hit, a recurring theme should have been, this may change next week, next month, this is what we know as of this date. There was not enough of that. So then you had people flipping, saying, well, you said this with such authority, and that we all needed to take this action on this date, and now you're saying this. Whereas if you can prevent that problem by setting expectations for the change, and that science is not a one and done, it is an ongoing exploration, there were a lot of opportunities to use that to help change the tide. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Science isn't a, a set of facts, it's a process. And we don't communicate that enough. And it's hard to do, I, I will grant you. Because you're, you're also wanna, you also want to communicate, if you're a scientist, you want to communicate the facts. And so somewhere along the line, you have to also alert people to the fact that everything's true until it's not true. Um, and I, I don't think we've done a great job at that. I, I'm not quite sure how to do a great job at that. As much as I enjoy talking to you, I don't want to have like the monopoly of asking questions. So I'd like to open it up to the floor. Um, so if there are any questions, please, gentlemen in the front to the left. Um, be honest. If you don't know it, just say, I don't know it yet. I might know it next week, in two weeks. And communicate if you were wrong, if your results were wrong. I mean, but in a respectful way. And this is the same if you communicate to public. I mean, just say, okay, we don't know it yet. We just try to ramble on and find answers on the way. And if you were wrong, just excuse yourself and that's it. It should be the same for politicians as well for researchers. I mean, I mean, that's, that's how we should do it. Uh, of course. 
Of course, I don't know should be a staple. Um, but I, don't, I don't particularly think I don't know does a ton for anyone. So a, a much better way of saying it, well, that's a possibility, and I, and I think it's a real possibility because of X, Y, and Z. On the other hand, there's A, B, and C that makes me think that it's not, that's not the case. And that's a much more interesting way to go. It's, it takes more time. Um, and at the same time, you're also balancing this. So, when, for example, when I taught medical students, I was teaching them things that I wanted them to remember 30 years from now. Not stuff, not the weeds that they could forget or, or look up on Google and it didn't matter. But stuff that I didn't want them to ever have to look up and I wanted them to always remember it. So those things are, you know, with very few exceptions, those are truths. You know, they're, they're science successes. Um, and so to put in time to, to tell them the unsureness is, is I, I, I haven't figured that out completely. I, I take your point. Um, I don't think it's that easy to do. If I could just add to that, sometimes and we're sort of talking about disinformation, and but I um, think about um, as a former working journalist, you know, I used to look at a piece of research and not completely understand it, and I would start with a question like, oh, so it looks like your research is about this, because I had no idea, you know, I was just like, I'm going to throw this out there and hope that you will educate me, because I don't know. And so that probably wasn't the best way to go about it, but I started as a journalist when I was 22 years old. And sometimes I think um, when a journalist at least throws that out there, I hear sometimes scientists saying, like, well, no, that's not really what my work is about. And that's, like, such a missed opportunity, because it automatically sort of kicks off the dialogue in a negative kind of way. But also, often journalists, especially journalists who do not routinely cover science, they really just want you to, to talk and help them understand. And they're just trying to get the conversation going. So I think, to your point, a better way of saying that is to even sort of ignore the first part of the question and be like, well, you know, let me, let me tell you what my work is really about, you know, and just get into it, so... I can agree with that. Yeah. I mean, very often, like us, we, we're covering like everything that happens in the U.S. and so sometimes also science, but I unfortunately have very little time then to like really dig into it. So if the journal, like, if the scientist can take me by the hand a little bit, of course, I try to prepare as much as possible, but every help is appreciated, if I may add that. <laughs> Any other questions? Then the back. like the, um, um, the idea of using storytelling in order to mitigate disinformation. And I think this is something that uh, a lot of scientists um, in the room during the pandemic have probably encountered a lot. Hey, so, you know, you're like a scientist. Tell me about these vaccinations and, you know, all of these things. Um, and maybe some, some other people share uh, this experience that I really felt like I'm hitting a wall. Um, so I was hoping if you could give us a specific example of how you would use storytelling in order to mitigate disinformation in the public. Yeah, great question. Um, and in giving a specific recipe, would need to, maybe we can even talk more after if you have a specific example, but in general for a toolkit for everybody, do not run away from the conflict. Embrace the conflict. Every good story across the ages has had conflict. Romeo and Juliet, if they met, fell madly in love, families got along, they lived happily ever after, nobody would remember them, right? So conflict is part of what makes a story sticky. Instead of avoiding it, which we often do in academia, right, at universities, you need to embrace it, address it, make that key in your story because then you have a cause for everyone to rally behind. And what makes things viral and catch on is when people feel a very strong emotion. And so whether it's a vaccine, whether it's that, you know, 5G's frying our brain, whether it's anything, you can bring and boil that one core conflict into a story where there is a human face and name, or whether it is your own conflict and struggle in trying to address something. 
tying in universal experiences like love, loss, frustration, which we've all felt in science and in the world outside. Having those universal experiences is core to fighting misinformation. One of the other many hats I wear, I'm a licensed private detective, and our family firm helps get innocent people out of prison. You have to be able to connect with people from any background, the roughest cities of you know, Chicago to boardrooms and corporate and you know, celebrities. And there are universal elements of being a human that are core. And when we're fighting misinformation, we have to take our ego out of it and some of those emotions that might lead to like knee jerks of like, how could you even think that? Empathy is number one. Your audience is thinking that for a reason. And being able to look into who that is and why will allow you to craft a specific story and narrative to address it so that you are coming together under a shared win-win instead of this like combative where you're shoving people into a corner and it then is a lose-lose. And so I'd be happy to talk about specific examples because the story is going to be different for every single one. But in general, those are some things that you can use. Yeah. If I may, like one example that we've seen a lot like on social media or in the media as well is fact-checking. Is that a good tool or is there also the danger that it's too much like top down, like I'm the teacher and I'm saying, no, 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 you're wrong about all of that? Great question. If you're going on a fact checking angle, a cool way to connect with your audience is to go on the journey with them. Ooh, I heard this. Is it true? Maybe this wasn't, hmm, not sure. And, and talk about the emotions as if you are that little detective going into it with them. Oh, I was surprised to find this. Here's the sourcing here. But It can't just be a, according to this source, X, Y, and Z. People's eyes glaze over, and then there's no human connection. Okay. One of the tools that we work with our students on in the improv session, our instructor uses yes and a lot, and it's to get the students into this space of trying to find common ground. And so, you know, he'll, he'll have these various activities where they just have to build on what the person before them did. And so they have to find, like, how can I connect? How can I add to that rather than that was stupid? Why are you acting like you're shoveling? Like, why would you do that? They, they have to roll with it and just find that common ground. And I think that's one way some of these... Um, Practicing these skills and getting out of that headspace of no, that's wrong can also be really helpful. And if you look at MIT, has done really cool research where they found that tweets, you're on Twitter, retweeting for false information is 70% more likely than true information. That's terrifying, right? And False information, spreading faster. If you have true information, it takes six times as long to reach the same 1,000 people. Why? Because there are people using storytelling without the facts who are spreading it, which is why we're all here today and helping spread the word and make these tools accessible, because you have to fight it. You can't unring the bell. People are still citing that autism vaccine study from way back when, when That person was prosecuted. That was taken back, but it was so sticky. It was in people's heads. So you have to make sure that everybody here has those tools with which to use it for good instead of evil. Any further questions from the audience? How, how have your programs changed throughout the time? Like, because, I mean, media and like our surround, surroundings and social media are changing so quickly and I mean, now we're like in this not totally post-pandemic, but still uh, age. How, how had, did you adapt the programs as you also learned what your students needed? And yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing we did is I, I had mentioned we added the giving students a choice. So yes, you can do a live presentation, but recognizing that students are going to have a digital presence. And so giving them that option to learn how to do some video editing and create a much shorter video that would um, work well on a personal website or um, a LinkedIn page, um, that was one thing. And then um, we were fortunate actually during the pandemic. So the online program that I mentioned, it actually was created in 2019. And so we were fortunate enough that we were able to pivot during the pandemic and leverage some of that online asynchronous content to still uh, reach our students and still continue the program throughout the pandemic. We've started teaching more social media. 
So not only have we given people the skills to write a story for a lay audience and distill science, but then once you've got the story, great. How do you get anybody to read it? That's where that engaging component comes in. So how do you not only write the story, but writing for social media is an art and a strategy, and you can use hooks to get people to learn and click. It must always be accurate. It must not overpromise. But there are ways that you cannot be boring, and you can tap into those emotional components. And we've had students express an interest for more of that because of everyone being locked down during the pandemic for a while. You can't share things in traditional ways. Everything went digital and on social. How? how yes? Mr. Fassman. How, how do you measure the success of your um, courses? Because I'm sure the courses will cost some money. And the president will ask, um, uh, is, this, is this money good invested? So how do you measure? Excellent question. It's a two-pronged approach of data and stories because showing that, you know, to your president or whomever is making decisions that it's a value, you need to tap into that. So there are course reviews after every class. Students give anonymous reviews. We also do debriefs with students and ask them specific questions and get stories about how they've helped and applied it in their own lives. We've had students go on to get jobs in science communications, go on to med school, get research grants, do some really cool work because of the things in the class. And we are starting to to do some more tracking as we go into social media to look at social listening and tracking of how far things are going. Um, but those are just some of the metrics. So we have actual surveys with data plus stories that we marry together. Anything you wanted to add to that, Peggy? Okay. We, um, we do two things as well. So when our students enter the program, they use a rubric to self-evaluate. So they record themselves presenting a video, and then they self-evaluate themselves at the very beginning of the course. And then they do the exact same thing at the end of the course so we can detect their self-perception of change. And then right now we have um, an IRB-approved study where we are taking the pre- and post-videos and sending them to undergrads and asking the undergrads to use this rubric to evaluate the clarity um, of the message and to also tell us what they think the message was. And then we can are in the process of um, we want to compare what the students think the message was to what the speaker intended the message to be to see if that alignment improves as a result of the program. Mm -hmm. and our program is about 10 years. It is 10 years old. We just celebrated our 10-year anniversary. Um, we do course teacher evaluations, but um, two years ago, I went back to some of the alums who had started early on and um, did some qualitative work around sort of what it's meant to them um, kind of a couple years out. And that was helpful in thinking through sort of like how do we revise, how do we modify, how are they using it? And I was so pleased to hear that they feel such a comfort level in communication and that for some of them, it led them to do things that they wouldn't have done otherwise, like take on speaking engagements or do more teaching work that they were interested in doing or do interviews with journalists that they might not have done otherwise. So I think that was also important to kind of go back and talk to some of the alums. Is there also a shift within the scientific community? Because of course, like uh, publishing your research in like scientific magazines is very important. And, but at the same time, also like building a, another presence, is that now something that also people see who then might like pour funds into your programs, like as a scientist? Is there a shift is, or, or not yet? Yeah. I think it's double-edged sword. Right. I, I think there's a lot, there are a lot of scientists who look down on scientists who communicate to the public. Uh, that's the old view. It's still around in in a great part. Um, and then there are those of us, I guess, you know, I'm old and tenured, and so I don't care. Mm -hmm. So I like doing it. Um, and there are a bunch of people that like doing it. But, but I don't think that it's, um, it's not the mode mm -hmm. amongst biology-minded scientists anyway. Uh, you know, I think there are f some fields where it's a little bit more the mode. Psychology happens to be one where they very much, you know, a lot of them uh, en engage with the public. And the other field, that it, and it's sort of predictable, is astrophysics because they need the public. And so they do engage with the public because the public is funding their telescopes. Mm -hmm. 
Um, uh, but biologists, I would say most people, uh, the reaction to me was, oh, Peggy, you're going to have to dumb down your science. You're going to dumb down neuroscience. How could you do that? And in the publishing world, it is interesting because there's an altmetric score now that folks may be familiar with if you've done research over here too, where it tracks not just your research publication, but the reach of it. So yes, you could have citations, but it's also where is it getting play in the media? Where is it getting online and in blogs? And people are looking that as a, to that as a metric for your success as a scientist and a researcher. That didn't used to be around like 20 years ago. So there is this shift where, yes, there's the old guard where some people are like, eh, not so sure about SciComs, but then there are these institutions and platforms being built that actually use it as a measure of career success. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if anyone works at a university that uses Interfolio, which um, measures sort of faculty activity reporting, but it also draws those sorts of citations and looks at that type of um, communication, which is interesting for some of um, the students who come through our program who do um, plan to have a career in the academy. Um, so one more reason for them to be great communicators. Mm-hmm. One, one last thing also is, uh, we talked about that earlier this morning, is also that the trust issue is also a question of like, relatability, like that you see people who look yet like yourself, who are talking about the issues. And I mean, I'm, I'm growing up to be one, but it's mostly old white men um, that like if you watch panel discussions or like tv shows like they are very often the first ones to jump like even when we call universities like the first ones who would say yes are elderly white men i don't know they like are more confident so with your programs you you have like students from like all backgrounds so do you think that by that you can also change it that like we can see more i don't know latinas more like black women more like a bigger diversity of scientists that are communicating in the public Yes, and there's nothing wrong with an old white no, guy I'm who is like, fabulous <laughs> at communicating science. <laughs> so what's our what's our, our gumball guy? What the hell was his <laughs> name? Oh my god! Oh my god! No. Anyway, I I, I can't think of his name right now. He, I didn't want to stigmatize. So him because, yeah, so I'm brilliant. Be one, so. <laughs> um, but I I I don't just mean that. About in that way, but I also am very actually interested in pe- people with differences, so commonly called disabilities. And if you look at the disability world, there is no one like you up there. There's going to be no one like you. Most disabilities, most rare conditions are rare. They're really, really rare. There's no one else like you. So this, this trope that we have to see people that are like us, no. I mean, I, I just don't... I'm, I'm not in, I'm not a supporter of that. I think that we need to treat every single person for what they have to offer. And no matter how they look or where they come from. And so, yes, there are some, some access issues that we need to address for people that have been marginalized for um, reasons that are, are true for the whole group. And there are ways that we have to increase access for people who are marginalized because of singular reasons. Um, And then other people who are just really, really good at what they do, no matter what they look like, they should be up there. Competence first. One of the... um, So just hearing you say that makes me think about um, when I went to journalism school a long time ago and I studied broadcast journalism, they taught me how to talk like a man, which I don't know if you had a similar experience, but, you know, the the idea was like you were supposed to lower your voice. And um, I did that for a while and and I damaged my vocal cords. Um, So if I have to like jump off stage, which I have to sometimes in public conversations, it's because I have a legitimate vocal cord problem from trying to lower my voice. And so um, now in our program, students ask about that, especially women. Like, 
well, tell me how to make myself sound more authoritative. Or, and, you know, the model years ago was to try to untrain women and try to teach them how to speak differently. And so now it's reversed. Now we spend a lot of time, like, don't change anything. Like, just do what you do and don't worry about that, you know, and just do it. And there's a lot of research about women's voices and how it lowers trust in the public when they hear high voices. And the answer to that is not to lower our voice, but to put it out there more. So anyway, thank you for that. That made me think this other thing. Thank you so much. I think we heard four great voices, <laughs> and I'm going to end it on that. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for talking to us. Um, I hope you stay around a little bit. So if anybody wants to like um, talk to you a little further, um, they might do so. Thanks. Uh, we're going to yeah move on to the next. So now it's uh, awards time, awards season, that's what they call it in Hollywood. It also in, exists in science. Uh, we're going to present the Asina awardees, there are three of them. Uh, first one is Jürgen Braunstein, he's the winner of the 2022 Asina Award in the category Junior Principal Investigator. He's a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs and is supported by the Edwin Schrödinger Fellowship of the Austrian Science Fund. We will hear from him later. Let me just introduce the two other um, awardees. It's Sabine Heitzneder. We briefly heard from her now during the, the panel discussion. She's the winner of the 2022 Asina Award in the category Young Scientist Award. She's an instructor at the Cancer Cancer immunology, immunolo sorry, I can't speak anymore, immunolo immunology and immunotherapy program of the Stanford Cancer Center Institute, sorry for that, and Niklas Tech, now he uh, is the other winner of the 2022 Asina Award in the category Young Scientist. He's working under the Erwin Schrödinger Fellowship of the Austrian Science Fund to research quantum chaos, harmonic analysis, analysis and lattices first at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. We'll start with Jürgen Braunstein, who cannot be here with us today, but he sent us a video message, which should be coming up any moment. We really should have prepared the drum roll. One key mechanism for strengthening trust in science and democracy is through transparency. Transparency is also a critical element in effective financial public management. And the lack in transparency is a major public policy issue surrounding sovereign wealth funds. Sovereign wealth funds are large state-owned investment funds which can be found almost everywhere in the world. These funds are very large. For example, the Norwegian fund is approximately with one trillion US dollars, the largest fund in the world, and owns on average 1.5% of every listed company in the world. Many of these funds, like the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, are also very opaque. And this has frequently raised questions about the motivation. Are the investments driven by economic logic or by politics? Related to this is a much more fundamental issue of why states create such funds in first instance and why some states don't. There are a number of theories out there making sense of this variety, but they cannot explain all. For example, why do we see very different funds in countries with very similar macroeconomic characteristics? Or why we see very similar sovereign wealth funds in countries with very 
different macroeconomic characteristics? Or why do some countries with very large surpluses and reserves, like Switzerland, consistently don't opt for the creation of a sovereign wealth fund, while other countries with very little surpluses and reasons to create a fund, create a fund, for instance, Turkey. In my research, I try to shed light onto those questions by bringing in transparency into the black box of sovereign wealth fund creation and the policymaking processes. Policymaking processes are structured in very different ways across countries, allowing for different actors to be represented and sometimes even over represented. So together these characteristics shaping the logic of policy and the mandate of the fund. I developed a framework which allows us to make sense of this variety and who benefits from it and who does not. And thereby, I hope to shed light on the understanding of government financial institutions and opening a new perspective. And I hope to foster greater government accountability by offering a window into government processes and facilitating thereby a better informed public debate. Next up is uh, Sabine Heitzneder, whose field I have obviously struggled to pronounce, but uh, she's going to explain it much better than I could do. Please, the stage is yours. Thank you. All right. Oftentimes in medicine, the solutions aren't simple. That was the statement Peter Nagele made this morning, and I have to say, Peter, I absolutely agree with you. So even though I'm not going to dance my science project today, even though I totally could, um, I hope that I can inspire you guys today um, in joining me to be excited about the potential of adoptive cell therapy, um, and that you will also join me in appreciate um, how much of a challenge it actually is to bring those uh, promising um, therapies to patients. So, let's see how we can get this started. That is not my presentation yet, so I might still have to dance in order to keep you guys engaged. <laughs> um, okay, here we go. So, survival rates for kids with high-risk solid tumors and brain tumors has not significantly increased in the last 40 years. To just give you one example, um, Ewing sarcoma is a rare childhood bone cancer for which um, between the 70s and the 90s, we improved the survival rate of about 17%. However, ever since then, we have been absolutely stagnant. And this is not because we aren't treating these patients with um, intensive enough uh, therapies yet. Actually, we've already hit a plateau, um, and the therapies that these kids get are so uh, dose intensive that up to 20% of those kids that survive end up developing a secondary cancer during their life. So that means because we treated cancer number one, they end up developing cancer number two sometime in their lifetime. So clearly we need um, targeted therapies and there's a huge unmet need um, for targeting cancer cells specific and not targeting normal tissues in the body. So how can we do this? One approach that facilitates this is called immunotherapy. And it's where we hack a patient's own immune system and equip it with receptors so that those receptors then target the tumor cells in the body but leave the healthy cells completely untouched. So here, um, as said, we take T cells out of the patient's own um, blood circulation. With a gene transfer, we equip them with a receptor. So we turn them into a CAR T cell or a chimerican antigen receptor. Then we infuse those cells back into the body um, of the patient where they go find the tumor cells, lyse the tumor cells in a specific manner. Um, and this approach is called CAR T cell therapy. So I'm going to talk a lot about CAR T cells today. So the most important thing and sort of the holy grail is we need to find proteins that are specifically only expressed on the tumor cells and not on healthy normal tissues. 
Um, and that is one um, of the main things that we have to tackle here. The potential of cellular immunotherapy has uh, stories and faces. Emily Whitehead was the first patient ever in 2012 in the spring to be treated with this uh, novel type of cell therapy. She was diagnosed with uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, had relapsed twice, which meant she was out of uh, other treatment options. Um, and then uh, was treated at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia where uh, they had just started a clinical trial with this type of therapy. These cells got her into remission and a year after she um, celebrated her first uh, one year cancer free anniversary. And she kept um, continuing anniversary after anniversary until earlier this year she was designated cured because she celebrated 10 years cancer free. So really um, I think uh, this emphasizes um, how much of a potential we have here using engineered cells in order to treat patients. After Emily, um, multiple other children were involved in this clinical trial. In total, 82% um, experienced a complete remission due to this therapy, meaning that their cancer completely went away. Um, this was designated a breakthrough therapy um, by the FDA and was approved in August 2017 to be accessible uh, for all. And a year later, it was approved in Europe. It also made headlines for numerous other reasons. Number one, it became the first cell therapy um, that was approved for the treatment of cancer. It was the first gene therapy that was approved for the treatment of cancer. And I think this is the most striking news. It had a very unusual developmental path because it was approved in children first. Only less than 10% of drugs that are being developed are actually developed for children. Most of them are developed for adults, and then later on we figure out if this molecular pathway target is also expressed in kids, and then, um, you know, it's kind of like the, the second line. Um, but I think what this emphasizes is what we can actually do if we focus on um, childhood cancer in the academic space. So now uh, the next huge question uh, that my research uh, was interested in is how do we make this type of treatment work for solid tumors and brain tumors? Because this now had worked in leukemia very well, which is a blood cancer, but how does this work for solid tumors and brain tumors? So um, as mentioned before, the holy grail is to find a protein that is really only on the tumor and not on any other normal tissue in the body. And I found that a protein called GPC2 is actually expressed in the developing brain. Um, so in the fetus, when the brain develops, this protein is, is expressed at high levels, but then it gets shut down at birth. And after birth, it is not expressed anymore in normal healthy cells. So using this um, as a target on the tumor cell, uh, I could utilize this and engineer CAR T cell receptors that could bind uh, GPC2. First, I wanted to understand how many molecules exactly of this protein are on patients' tumor cells. And I figured out that it was about 5,000 molecules per cell by developing um, an, a specific assay for um, this manner. This was important because on, in comparison to tumor cells that we grow in petri dishes in the lab or patient tumor cells that we grow in mice, it was actually much higher and didn't really represent how many molecules per cell were found on the patient tumor cells. So this largely overrepresents uh, what we think is actually there. Only some of them closely resembled what's really on patient tumor cells. So this, to me, um, told me that we re I really need to be careful in which models I um, use for preclinical development of these receptors so that I can really pick the right disease models. Um, so then I engineered CAR T cells. And I figured, uh, I already knew, I need to pick a disease model where the cells um, only have 5,000 molecules of this receptor on the surface. And I also, also thought that probably one of these CAR T cells will uh, need to win the fight against more than one tumor cell. So I challenged my CAR T cells with five times the amount of tumor cells um, in comparison to one CAR T cell. And I found that the receptors I had engineered, they had an anti-tumor effect, um, so that was good but it really wasn't all that strong enough yet. So I made modifications um, to the architecture of these receptors and was then able to increase the potency um, from sort of low to medium. Um, and now they actually did kill the tumor cells under these conditions in a Petri dish. 
I was really excited to see um, that these receptors were also able to mediate potent anti-tumor effects in animal models. So in comparison to the um, CAR receptors um, number one, um, the novel um, engineered receptors were now able to cure mice that um, were engrafted with these tumors. Then I actually realized that some of these tumors come back. So if you really think about applying this in patients, we don't want that, that to happen, right? So I um, figured that I probably still need to increase the signal strength even more in order to prevent this from happening. So I gave my most uh, potent constructs to this state uh, an additional boost uh, and was then able to show that now these constructs were able to um, really um, mediate strong and sustained uh, complete responses. So in comparison to the first two versions, this version now um, can really mediate uh, long and sustained anti-tumor responses. Um, okay, so this is, uh, this is good, it works, it's, uh, it clears the tumor, but is it safe? So the next question was, um, if this shows any sign of on, what we call on target of tumor toxicity. So is it really only killing the tumor or does it have any effect on normal tissues? And despite the strong clearance of the tumor, I actually didn't see any signs of um, toxicity in the tissues of these mice. Um, once these receptors are optimized, um, they're actually poised to mediate uh, potent um, effects in um, other types of cancer, not only the ones that it was initially developed for. And the reason is because these fetal antigens that are expressed during development are oftentimes shared between different cancer types. So I realized that GPC2 is actually also expressed on a very common childhood brain tumor, which is called medulloblastoma. So I, I was wondering um, if this therapy could also work in childhood brain tumors. Um, and again, um, my CAR receptors were able to mediate um, potent anti-tumor responses. And the boost version was really able to clear the tumor um, without seeing any recurrence of them. So this is all mice, right? So actually we developed this for humans. So where, do, where does the field stand when it comes to CAR T cell therapies for childhood brain tumors? And for this reason, I would like to introduce you to um, probably one of the devastating, most of the devastating diseases that is out there. Um, it is called DIPG or diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma uh, or DMG. So it is an aggressive childhood brain tumor that grows in the brain stem or in the spinal cord. Um, it is characterized by a, a mutation which makes it universally lethal. So that being said, the average life expectancy after diagnosis is about 10 months. Um, and so far, um, in the history of the disease, there hasn't been any um, anti-tumor response or improved prognosis with any drug that's been tested. So this is basically where you tell um, parents that the kid was unfortunately diagnosed with this disease, there's nothing we can do about it, um, and the average life expectancy is 10 months. Um, my colleagues in the lab have figured out that there's a target on these tumor cells, which is called GD2. And we had already been working on CAR T cell receptors that can target GD2. So it was clear that we really needed to try this, and my colleagues at Stanford uh, initiated a phase one clinical trial. Um, and um, I would like to um, tell you one example um, out of the 11 patients that have been treated so far who came in wheelchair bound, incontinent, and in uncontrollable pain. And after um, about five infusions of these CAR T cells, uh, which was eight months um, after diagnosis, um, presented walking, continent, and without significant pain. And experienced, as you can see um, on these images um, there, that the tumor had shrunk by 99%. So this is quite groundbreaking, right? Because so far in the history of the disease, um, these tumors hadn't responded yet. And the um, radiologists that actually you know, saw these uh, images were like, not quite sure what to write. I've never seen this in the course of my entire career. Uh, so this has been quite uh, groundbreaking. And I think it really emphasizes the type of potential we have in utilizing cell therapies for childhood brain tumors. So now I'm working with the team at Stanford um, and with the colleagues at the National Cancer Institute in translating these CAR T cell receptors that I developed for GPC2 for children um, with solid tumors and brain tumors to be enrolled in a phase one clinical trial, which will open at Stanford next year. So somebody will be patient number one. 
Um, it comes with a price tag. Um, so just to develop this therapy, so to get uh, the vector, to make the products, and then to manufacture about 40 um, products for patients is about $4 million, um, which I think uh, you know, emphasizes um, the type of challenges we face in bringing these types of therapies to patients. Um, it is reflected by the fact that so far, even though it's been you know, designated a breakthrough therapy and was approved um, by the drug um, authorities in 2017, we still only have one product approved for children. As compared to five other products that um, have ever since then been um, approved for um, adult diseases. And I think this emphasizes the robust, that the robust development of potent and safe cell therapies and also the phase one clinical uh, testing really is a duty of the academic um, arena and needs to happen in university hospitals to show the first efficacy data and then um, get uh, the industry interested. So how does this look currently um, in the US, in Europe? In the US, we have about 50 clinical trials for cell therapies open for kids to enroll in pediatric applications. About 90% of them are academia initiated. So this is where the university um, hospital has um, initiated and sponsored the trial. In Europe, even though we have more than twice the amount of people, we only have 11 trials open right now, um, and less of them um, are academia initiated. So that's about only 15% of what the US is currently doing. Um, as you can imagine, you know, with these types of results, there's a lot of colleagues um, and you know, people that um, I know from Austria that reach out to me these days that are either, you know, either have a patient or somebody in the family or know someone who knows someone who knows someone who is affected by this um, and curious if and where um, patients can get enrolled um, in these trials. Um, the number of cell therapy trials that are accessible for kids with high-risk childhood cancer in Austria is currently zero. Um, and I hope that this is really a not yet um, and that this type of results will spark some momentum um, and that we will see, uh, see this happening in the future in Austria as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it, I think this emphasizes that it really does take a lot to make these type, um, types of therapies happen. First of all, it needs a lab where you can focus on the preclinical development of these cell therapies, similar to what I did with GPC2. It also requires a uh, department that works on the clinical trial design process development that you know, figures out how to mix, make these products. Um, then it takes um, the hospital team and staff um, who is able to run a phase one clinical trial. And ideally, um, it also entails a correlative science unit where it, then you can learn from the clinical trial and from the data, why did some patients um, respond and other student, and how can we use this information in order to understand how we need to kind of re-engineer the product to increase the number of patients that can um, respond to these therapies. Um, and having these four pillars kind of like under the same roof is really the dream workplace of a translational clinician scientist, um, where you know you can see your um, um, your scientific um, efforts really applied all the way through uh, to making it uh, to patient application. Um, so despite you know, all of the challenges we faced in bringing these, pa uh, these therapies to patients, um, I hope that I've sparked uh, your enthusiasm um, for the huge potential we have um, in cellular immunotherapy, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sabine. Now I'd like to invite uh, Niklas to present his research. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. And the mic. Is it better? Yes. Perfect. Thanks. Um, thanks for the nice introduction and the opportunity to give this talk. Um, so, am I, ah, perfect. So yes, as already was said, I'm sponsored by the Austrian Science Fund, by Schrodinger Fellowship. Um, and for the next 10 minutes, I would like to uh, accomplish two things. First of all, I should tell you what the title says. So who the hell was Littlewood? What was his problems? And secondly, um, I would like to uh, tell you a bit about uh, what I've been working on in the last, thing, uh, last couple of years, 
So uh, with my good collaborator and friend Sam Chow, we've developed some uh, new methods that help us overcome stumbling blocks in the Afantine approximation. And I just want to give you a glimpse of what that is. Um, so the Afantine approximation is really about making life easier. A lot of times you're faced with um, working with very complicated numbers, very annoying things, you know. You want to know how much wine is in my barrel. And then you look at the barrel, it has like a, you know, a circular thing at the bottom, and you ask yourself, uh, what's this area of a circle? And then you're confronted with pi, and pi is really annoying. It's, it's really not that cool as people make it out. It's annoying to compute, and since antiquity, people have tried to do something about it, so this is a very ancient branch of mathematics. It goes back to Diophantes of Alexandria, who lived somewhere between 200 before Christ and 200 after Christ. Not much is known. Um, and already, you know, the ancient Greeks, the Indians, Babylonians, they all had their own approximation to pi because they wanted to know how much wine is in the barrel. Okay? Um, so let's make this a bit more abstract, which is useful. So we take a favorite number alpha, which is a nasty number. We want to get rid of it. We want to replace it by a nice number. Um, and then we, are, you know, we don't want to work with too difficult numbers, so we take fractions, p over q. Um, and you, we want to keep the denominator q to be somewhat small, because we don't want to work with a fraction with a denominator a million. Okay? So the name of the game is Look at this formula. You have your number alpha. You want to compute the closest fraction with a given denominator. OK, so this is an ancient question. Um, so hopefully, there is an answer. And yes, there is. So uh, Dirichlet, a German mathematician with a very lengthy name, Johann Peter Gustav Lejeune Dirichlet, um, lived somewhere in the 19th century. And he says, um, OK, no matter what your nasty number is, I can guarantee there is some fraction p over q so that I can do one over the denominator square of quality. Um, let me see if I can go back. Um, can I go back? No. OK, so you know the significance of this square is actually, if you look at it trivially, uh, so you just take your number, you compute the fraction, what you can certainly assure is 1 over the denominator, because all of these fractions with the given denominator, they're spaced 1 over denominator apart. 1 over q, 2 over q, 3 over q, so on. So that's their spacing. So 1 over q you can do. But Dirichlet says, ha, I can do 1 over q square. And it's significant, because if your denominator is 1,000, this says the error you make, the trivial error would be 1 over 1,000. But Dirichlet says, OK, you can do 1 over a million, which is much better. Um, and this is not just an answer that originally provided. It is the optimal answer in that context. So in fact, you cannot do much better. You can take numbers for which this is really the truth. You can just do 1 over denominator squared, at least for infinitely many denominators. And then you need to strategize what the best denominator is which is a question I don't want to get into in 10 minutes because it's complicated. But that's the right order of magnitude that we know. And then, you know, people thought about this and they said, OK, I can do one number. So if I can do one, maybe I should go on to two. So they took two numbers, alpha and beta, and they said, ah, so what can I say about approximating these two numbers with fractions with the same denominator at the same time? So this is a question. How small can I make this kind of expression, which is on display, with a, different, uh, with a given choice of the denominator q? And by what I just told you, you can apply this theorem of Dirichlet. Um, by the way, theorem is how mathematicians call their findings. It's a bit of strange language, but I'm going to expose you to it. Um, so by that theorem of Dirichlet, you can take your first uh, approximation error, alpha minus p1 over q, and you get a 1 over q square infinitely often. And then for the next guy, you might not be so lucky, so the best you can maybe do is 1 over q. 
So I just told you, for two numbers, you get denominator cubed. That you're guaranteed infinitely often. Um, and this brings us to Littlewood. This is the culprit. So um, Littlewood said, OK, this very simple application of Dirichlet's theorem that I just showed you, this is not the best you can do. There should be something better. So what Littlewood said is, no matter what two numbers you choose, alpha and beta, if you fix any kind of small epsilon, so think about one over a million, one over a trillion, whatever small number you fix, um, you write down these two approximation errors, you multiply them, you could also add them, but mathematicians somehow like to multiply them, just out of curiosity, really. Um, so you multiply them, and you ask yourself, can I solve this kind of approximation quality? Can I guarantee this for infinitely many denominators? And this is what Littlewood asked. This is his problem from the 1930s. So it's very innocent. We understand one number, now we're trying to do two. What can we do? Okay. Um, and the answer is embarrassing. It's not the, all that much, really. Um, you know, we really, really lack answers to this. So um, not much is known. And some of the highest prizes in the last years were given to partial results on this. Um, there's no Nobel Prize in mathematics, in case uh, that's of interest to you. But there is a Fields Medal, which is handled as the equivalent. And some of the Fields Medals were given on making progress on these type of questions. So people really care. Um, and yeah, Littlewood, Littlewood was also a very strong mathematician, so he couldn't do it, which is also kind of a warning sign. Um, so, you know, with Sam, Sam and I had a look at this, and we looked at the following variants. So this is what we found. Um, you take any uh, four numbers. So this is a typo, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Um, oh, I can't give a presentation without a typo. Um, OK, you take your first number, which is not rational, because if, if it's rational, it's, it's just stupid. You don't, it's not interesting. Um, OK, um, and then you look at this little wood type expression. So you multiply the approximation errors, and you ask, can I beat what I get from Dirichlet? Can I beat Dirichlet? Uh, and the thing is, yes, you can. Uh, in fact, the epsilon is, re is replaced by something which is going to zero. So this is a much stronger result in a quantitative sense. But there's a caveat. Otherwise, we would probably get a Fields Medal. Um, and the caveat is, OK, you can fix any three of the numbers. And over the fourth one, you lose somewhat the control what it does. So this beta here is sort of generic. There's some small, exotic, exceptional betas that we cannot handle. But otherwise, it's really answering this conjecture of Littlewood in a strong sense. And the satisfying thing is um, this answers a question of our former bosses. So Viktor Berisnevich, Alan Haynes, and uh, Sandra Villani had asked about this. And we gave a strong, optimal answer, in fact, to this question. Um, so this is all I wanted to tell you. So. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Niklas. Now I know who to call when I struggle next time, when I'm having issues with calculating the tip before taxes here in the US, you know, in restaurants. I want your number. Uh, thank you very, very much to all of the uh, awardees. I have been told that Jürgen is also following along uh, via live stream. We have more awards to hand out. The next one is the Austrian Marshall Plan, uh, Plan Foundation Poster Award. There are three awards. Uh, we had a lot of submissions. They were done online after COVID times. Um, that worked out pretty well. There was also a big like, audience participation. Uh, I'm told over 1,600 uh, people voted online and also gave their input to the top 10 posters. And for that, I'd like to ask up on the stage 
the three representatives. One is missing currently, so we'll start with the, the first two. So please, uh, Ursula Jakovec, Executive Vice President of the Austrian Science Fund. And uh, Markus Schweiger, <laughs> Executive Director of the Marshall, Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation. And we're waiting for number three, number three Johannes Eigner, Johannes uh, Oster Director. There he is. There yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Just got a quick phone call in, and uh, now let's get the next thing done. So, and the prize goes to Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation Post Award. Third place, it's Esther Haidt from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology for her poster, Advancing the Computer-Aided Prediction of Chemical Reactions via Gem Informatics. Second place is Denise Haselwanter, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, for her poster, The Human Antibody Response to Yellow Fever Virus Vaccination Display Redux, Reduce Potency Against a Major Circulating Brazilian Strain. Uh, thank you. Before I announce the winner, I would like to thank the Oster team for organizing the event, the FWF for reviewing the abstracts and making a short list, and the scientific jury yeah, for ranking the posters. The winner of the 2022 Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation Poster Award is Martin Wilkovic, Massachusetts General Hospital, for his poster. Bio Otornachel, turn off. <laughs> Hi, everybody. First of all, I'm very sorry I cannot attend in person today. I would have loved to join you and meet all of you, but I'm nine months pregnant, so unfortunately I'm not able to fly to Chicago at this time. Instead, I would like to virtually thank the jury and the audience for their votes for my poster for ERA 2022, as well as the Green Group at MIT, which made this work possible. I'm very honored to have received the Pro Prize in the competition, and thanks also to the Austin Marshall Plan Foundation for providing this excellent opportunity for Austin researchers to present their work. I would also like to congratulate all other contestants for the excellent contributions, which I really enjoyed to watch, and of course, congratulate the awardees of the first and second place. So keep up the good work and hopefully see you sometime in person. Bye. Hi everybody, I'm Denise Haslwanta and I wanted to say many thanks for this year's Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation Post Award. And I also wanted to say many thanks to the Office of Science and Technology Austria and the Austrian Science Fund. Of course, I also wanted to give a big shout out to everybody who was working with me on this project, especially to my former boss and mentor, Professor Dr. Karlik Chandra. Of course, um, I also wanna say many, many thanks to everybody who was watching the video and was voting for me and I am really sorry I'm not able to attend this year's ARIT and to accept my prize in person but I wish you all a really great meeting enjoy it bye bye hi everybody Martin Milkovich here I hope you have a wonderful time in Chicago unfortunately I can't be there to receive this amazing award in person but I'm very pleased and honored to make the first place at this year's poster session. I want to thank the Office of Science and Technology Austria, the Austrian Science Fund, and the Austrian Marshall Plan Foundation, as well as the committee of the expert juries for selecting my contribution to win this award. Also, many, many thanks to everybody who voted for my poster. I really appreciate it. Last but not least, as it is always a team effort, I want to thank my colleagues and the team behind this research. 
First and foremost, the mastermind of SAFE, Jonathan Carlson, but also Ralf Weisleder and Hannes Mikula for their endless support. Thanks again, and I wish you a great time in Chicago. Thanks. Yeah, once again, congratulations to all of the awardees. That's it for this year's ARET. Um, now there's some closing remarks. Uh, there's also more networking coming up uh, at the reception, which starts at 6.30. I'm being told to be there as punctual as possible because apparently it's on the 40th floor, perfect to take pictures during golden hour. So if you want to reach out to your audience on social media, <laughs> that might be something. <laughs> or just take some nice pictures uh, while enjoying a good glass of wine or beer or water, whatever. Um, there will be um, shuttles that will go from here to the Palmer House Hilton, as well as from the Hilton then to the reception location. It's also just like a five-minute walk, so if you want to walk, um, get some fresh air. Uh, should be manageable. Uh, you can also get all the information about the reception if you scan your QR code on your badges, and uh, you'll find out from where the shuttles leave, what the walking distance is, so it should be pretty easy to find. Um, yes, now there's only one thing to do. Hand over once again to Johannes for his closing remarks. Many thanks, Christoph. Uh, just for you to know, the, the, the phone call I just had to take uh, told me that the shuttle from here to the Hilton won't take place, but I think that's not a big uh, deal because it's not that far. So as you took the way on foot to this place, I think you are perfectly fit to uh, take the way back also on foot and we won't have this shuttle going back from here to the Hilton. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning... Um, I entered uh, this day with a sense of curiosity. And uh, what I can say at the end, um, this uh, curiosity has been highly rewarded. I don't know how you feel, but I feel just enriched by today's enthusiasm, by, by the atmosphere here, by the goodwill and the excellence uh, together here in, in this room. First of all, many thanks, Christoph, uh, for guiding us through this day. Uh, I think you really made a difference, and uh, I'm just, again, grateful that, that you were with us and, and were our master of ceremony. Please, a big round of applause for Christoph. Thank you. <clears throat> At the same token, many thanks uh, to you, panelists, keynote speakers, awardees, and to all of you taking part in today's discussions. Also, many thanks to you in the background uh, making this conference possible, the technicians, caterers, those of you responsible for the live stream, all uh, who provided for a smooth operation of this conference. And uh, last but definitely not least, many, many thanks to my marvelous team at uh, the Austrian Embassy Washington, at the Oster team, uh, with whom I have the honor and pleasure, I want to say, to work with. You made today's ARIT possible, but not only today's ARIT, but the whole program of the Austrian delegation spanning from last Thursday until coming Monday. Just for you to know, there is Ali back there. Please turn around. Um, actually, actually, he's the only one who witnessed an ARID before us. All the other team is just new, um, as I am. So Ali was the one to provide us with the institutional memory. Many thanks to you, Ali. What should I say? Thank you. Then there's you, Julia, just behind there. Just turn around. Uh, she joined. <laughs> she joined us the, this spring, and uh, Julia enriches us with her academic background and with her experiencing experience in organizing events 
like that. And there is Marlene. Where is Marlene? There is Marlene over there. <laughs> Coming from the Austrian Ministry of Education, Science and Research, she joined us for half a year and unfortunately she will leave us for Vienna after this conference, which for me and for us is way too early. Uh, many thanks, Marlene. This brings to this year's ARIT to a close, but we are not finished yet. As Christoph already mentioned, you are all cordially invited uh, for this year's ARIT and ASCINA reception, uh, which will start at 6.30 p.m. sharp at the library that's just around the corner at uh, 190 LaSalle Street. That's within five minutes walking distance. So I hope to see Many of you, uh, hopefully all of you, uh, in uh, one and a half hours' time. And on this very happy note, uh, many thanks for coming and see you tonight. Thank you. Thank you.